Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeLynn. It is uh, January 21st, 2022, and we are so super excited uh, for today's Mormon Stories interview. Um, today, we have with us uh, uh, who I, someone who I think is a very, very special and important guest, um, Neville. Tell us, tell us your full name, uh, if you don't mind, and where you're where you're joining us from. Yeah, sure. Neville Rocco, Neville Grant Rocco. I'm uh, joining you from Adelaide, Australia. All right, and I'm also going to add Gerardo to the mix. Hey, Gerardo, so glad to have you with us. Hey, thanks, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this interview. Yeah, um, Neville, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about yourselves, but I always just like to let my listeners know why I picked them so that they can kind of, hopefully they can just take my word for it, that this is going to be worth their time. Uh, Neville, in your modesty, you'll probably take issue with that characterization. <laughs> but Neville, uh, I was introduced to you, I believe possibly by Simon Southerton, but also possibly through other means. But if I had to summarize why I'm so excited to talk about Neville, I would say that that Neville and it's Rocco, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Rocco, yeah, but that's Rocco. that's close enough. Rocco, yeah. okay. Neville Neville Rocco, uh, in some sense, kind of represents a similar level of, you know, influence or prestige or gravitas, in my view, that uh, that Tom Phillips maybe had in the UK. So. I, I don't, you know, I know that Tom Phillips is most well known for having received the second anointing. Neville, I haven't even asked you if if that was something that was even an opportunity that was presented to you. But what I will say is, is that I have to imagine that at some level, um, you, your your status or your importance in Australia is, is somehow, at least in the same family or category of, of what I imagine Tom Phillips's was in the UK. And for those of you who don't know Tom Phillips in the UK, he he was you know bishop served stake president twice, um, and and uh, was just very very deeply respected and well regarded throughout the UK before he had a, a crisis of faith and ended up leaving the Mormon Church. And of course, Tom Phillips did receive the second anointing. And in our Mormon Stories podcast, he was willing to talk about it. So um, Neville, uh, thank you for coming on, and I would love to invite you just really quickly to um, maybe introduce yourself to our audience uh, at a high level, correct or add to anything that I've said, and then we'll jump into your amazing story. Is that okay? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about comparisons, so I won't venture into those, but uh, uh, I was a convert to the church uh, in my late teens and uh, spent a long time very dedicated and devoted to the church. Uh, I have... Uh, experienced i guess most things that one would experience from a a, a good uh, life in the in the mormon church i served several missions i uh, uh, have been a bishop i've been in the stake presidency i've been in the mission presidency uh penny my wife and i were uh the church's representatives at the eu for two years, working in the uh, Brussels office of the church. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, great opportunities that have come our way through the church. Uh, and I think the best way to summarize where I am now is that our relationship with the, with the church has changed over the last few years uh, through some experiences that I'm sure, John, you'll draw out uh, as we go along, but uh, it's at a point now where I don't believe in the uh, truth claims that the church makes. I uh, I can't accept those, but I have deep respect for a number of members of the church with whom I'm still good friends, and they respect my position as well. Um, we have uh, three children. We have uh, four grandchildren. Uh my the other side of my life has been that I've had a what I'd describe as a very exciting legal career. I've uh, enjoyed uh, a great time at the what we call the bar. I've uh, practiced as a barrister for several years. 
and uh, in 2008 I was elevated to Queen's Council and uh, I've also just finished uh, a PhD thesis uh, on human rights and uh, international uh, rights and constitutional law. Um, I think that's a reasonable snapshot. If there's anything that I've missed that you think is important, John, I'm sure you'll ask me. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect, Neville. Um, it's just a one one thoughtful uh, Australian Mormon story, and so I'm, I'm just really and and you are a convert to the church. So today we're going to be talking about your life before Mormonism, your conversion to the Mormon Church, all the many ways that the Mormon Church, I'm going to guess, was actually very beneficial and useful to you in your life, all that you learned from it. And then, you know, what, what has led to a change in your relationship with the Mormon church and kind of where, where you, where you are today. So that's where we're in store for, let's just say a two or three hour Mormon stories interview. And of course, Neville, if you need to take a bathroom break or however they would say that in Australia, go to the loo. I'm not sure. How they say that. uh, <laughs> that's right. Or yeah. and I will cover for you uh, <laughs> as you need to step out. But we go, Thank we you. go long, we go long and deep on Mormon Stories podcast. As that's you know. that's great fun. I'm looking forward to it. Gerardo, anything you want to say before we jump in? No, just just really excited. Um, I think something that's really interesting about Neville's story. I think he has some uh, insight into the church's legal movements um, in Australia. And so it's going to be really interesting to hear um, how the church operates legally in Australia. Yeah. And Neville, I asked you just to explain this right before we started, but for our listeners who, who don't know, do you mind explaining kind of your, your legal title or position in Australia and what that means? Cause it's on the thumbnail and it's kind of in the title Queens council, right? Yeah, sure. Um, we uh, we follow the English tradition of having a separate uh, profession between solicitors and barristers, uh, and within barristers, there's a division between uh, what are called junior counsel. Uh, by junior, it's got nothing to do with their age. It just uh, means that they're not senior counsel, and senior counsel or Queen's counsel is the upper division of barristers or what we call the inner bar. Um, so uh, Queen's Council is a uh, an accolade that is received after a barrister has practiced uh, in a number of areas and received a lot of experience and has attained a level of eminence that the, uh, that the state uh, acknowledges by conferring the title uh, Queen's Council or QC, which is usually uh, after their name. Um, and uh, it means that you get to do the more complex cases. Uh, you usually work with a junior barrister and solicitors. Um, the solicitors take the instructions from the client. The barristers get the case ready and, and present it uh, in court. And uh, I've, I've had opportunity over the several years to work with uh, some great legal teams. I've really enjoyed my associations in the legal profession. Uh, I consider our profession here to be a, a noble one, uh, a respectful one and a respectable one. I trust all of my colleagues implicitly and uh, love working with them. I also have great respect for our judges. We have a, a very good judiciary in this country, I think, and it's uh, one that's respected through the world, but uh, I'm very, I've, there's never been a day when I've not been very happy to get up and go to work because I just love the work very much. Love it. Okay. Uh, well, Neville, where does your pre Mormon story, your pre Mormon Australian story begin? Let's start there. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think it's fair to say that I was probably born on what we might call the wrong side of the tracks. Um, my family weren't particularly uh, well off. In fact, I think they were lower middle class or maybe even working class. My father was uh, in the Navy. Uh, my mother was uh, uh, home duties. Uh, 
without going into it too much, uh, my family was fairly dysfunctional. Uh, it wasn't a very happy home. Uh, but somehow I was able to cut through because um, even though we lived in poorer areas, I found refuge in, in books and ideas from a very early age. That gave me a way of uh, escaping from what was a pretty pretty awful sort of uh, milieu. Um, so I was born in Sydney, uh, grew up in what we call the Western suburbs, which are the, uh, which is the poorer area of Sydney. Um, I uh, did my primary or elementary education at Sydney. I did very well at school. Um, I was always the smallest kid in the class uh, and the youngest kid in the class because I'd skip grades. Um, and I, I, was, I was given a pretty rough time with bullying, I think because of my uh, bookwormy weights, which were really out of keeping with the area in which we lived. Um, when, we fin when I finished uh, primary school, we uh, moved to Adelaide. Uh, which is where I live now. Um, I went to, a, again, a fairly down at heel high school. Uh, it wasn't very good. But then when I got to university, I think that's really when I got my break. I was finally among people that uh, I could relate to. Um, I, I loved law school. I loved uh, the intellectual challenge. I loved the... Uh, I, I just loved everything about it. And that's really where I came into my own, I discovered uh, lots of things that could give me solace. But um, in the middle of all that, I was converted to the church. Uh, I, I Stephen, met... can I ask you, can I, I'm sorry, Neville, can I ask you a question just really quickly? Of course. So yeah. you, you, you kind of referenced this a little bit, but this is something that I've found, uh, you know, I've found in my missionary experiences as a Mormon missionary, and I, I find is very common in in the lives of those who convert to the LDS church. And that's that oftentimes people that convert to high demand religions come from pretty turbulent, often come from very turbulent backgrounds. You don't find people who are like super healthy, super happy, came from a great family, have a great career. And then they join Mormonism, you know, as an adult with a high education level and a super happy life. There's usually often a pretty turbulent life or a pretty turbulent upbringing that somehow makes them seeking, puts them on a path to seeking uh, to fill some holes or to repair some wounds from their upbringing. You know, you talked to you, I think you referenced a bit that it was maybe a bit of a difficult upbringing, but do you want to talk about maybe what, what was it about your life that made you ripe or, or, uh, I don't want to say vulnerable cause that's negative. Like that made you open or amenable or curious about, uh, a religion like Mormonism. My amenability, uh, came in two ways. I think first, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I met a friend at school who was a Christian and he invited me along to his church, a Christian church which I attended, and it wasn't long before I became uh, what we refer to as a, as a born-again Christian. Um, and I know that's a term that's uh, common in the States as well. <clears throat> so um, that was my pathway, I guess, to give me some sort of eternal hope. Um, whether I was seeking that uh, as such, I couldn't really say, but I could say this, that um, I met another friend who was reading the book of uh, the, the New Testament in the library at school. I asked him what church, do, uh, church he belonged to, and he said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What do they believe? The Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. And that started a, uh, a fairly long process of investigation, which I undertook with him. Uh, a lot of debate, a lot of hope on my part that I might be able to prove it all wrong. Um, but uh, in due course, I was uh, converted 
to the LDS faith. Um, I think some of the draw cards for me were, uh, in contrast to my own family, it uh, presented a pattern for raising and conducting a happy family. Um, they used to have in those days the family and evening manuals, uh, which I found very attractive. The other, the other thing was that it presented me with the truth, as, as it was claimed. Um, and uh, the What's glory the... of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. And those concepts were very attractive to me. Um, and it seemed to me like a life raft, as it were, from what was a fairly... Uh, unhappy type of uh, life that I was leading it in my family. The other refuge that I found was um, I built sort of a bubble or an internal world in my family. I, I was very interested in art and music and literature uh, and that and uh, film and, and those sort of intellectual pursuits. So I had a modality for a family that was being presented to me by the Mormon church. And there was an escape intellectually into these other worlds that I enjoyed very much. So I think the two coalesced to give me an avenue out. And that avenue led on to university, uh, to my uh, obtaining law degrees and uh, to what has really been a fairly happy life uh, since I started to gain uh, an education. So what age did you start uh, investigating Mormonism approximately? Um, I think it was about 16 or 17. Um, I, I remember the converting experience very vividly. Uh, I was in my, in my bedroom at home, uh, door shut alone, and I was reading the book by Legrand Richards, a marvelous work and a wonder. I um, I was really enjoying that, and then I came to one of the early chapters that says Joseph Smith was prophesied in the Bible. I remember the the disgust that I felt at that claim. I thought, really, everything's going well. You don't really need to spoil it with this preposterous claim that Joseph Smith is somehow. You know, somebody that uh, was prophesied thousands of years before. So I put down the book in disgust and I thought, well, that was going well for a while, but clearly that's not the way forward for me. And then I just got this, I guess at the time I would have called it a prompting. Now I, I'm not sure what I'd call it, but uh, it was a prompting at the time to open my Bible to Isaiah 29 in the Old Testament. And those who are familiar with Mormon uh, doctrine or its culture know that Isaiah 29 is a fairly pivotal scripture. And I read that. And as I, as I was reading it, um, it was as if the page melted away before me and I just saw visually the events of the restoration of the gospel, including the translation of the Book of Mormon, the... Uh, uh, the offering of Charles Anthem, the opportunity to translate the book and uh, not being able to read a sealed book. And so as a result of that experience, uh, that became foundational for me. It was what we would call in the biblical sense a Pentecostal experience uh, as I interpreted it because it was deeply spiritual. It was uh, it was the heart burning, all those sorts of things that Mormons are familiar with. And I wanted to shout the restoration of the gospel from the rooftops. I was profoundly persuaded at that point that it was all true. Um, I, I have a question for you, Neville. Um, so this, all these things that you were, uh, that, that you knew about Charles Anthon and the prophecy about not being able to read a sealed book, did you learn those things through uh, Legrand Richards' book? Is that correct? I, I'd learned it through my long discussions with my friend. 
uh, through the reading of the material that he gave me. I mean, none of the things that I saw in that uh, visionary experience uh, were new. It was just the way that they flowed so nicely as it were on the page that that was a new experience. It all it brought it all together. The, the difficulty, and I think we'll come back to this in any event, uh, but uh, the difficulty that I have with that experience now uh, as riveting and as changing as it was for me at the time was that the, the, the vision, as I think you're suggesting, was a regurgitation of things that I'd already learned, and it was. There was nothing new. But um, one thing that was interesting was the process of translation of the Book of Mormon that I saw in this uh, visionary experience, and it was Joseph Smith sitting at a table with the Urim and Thummim, with the plates, and translating. There was no rock in a hat phenomenon, uh, none of the things that now seem to have uh, osmotically have been absorbed into Mormonism. Now, that's, that's significant for one reason. At the time, uh, I was obviously still in communication with people from my previous church, and they were giving me a lot of what was called uh, anti-Mormon literature. And uh, uh, one of the tracts that I was given suggested that Joseph Smith had actually not translated the Book of Mormon from plates, mm. but that he had... Uh, just put a rock in a hat, and the rock was one that he'd found when he was a, a, a treasure digger, and he used that rock to uh, dictate the Book of Mormon from what he saw in the hat. I put that both to the missionaries and to my friends, uh, oh, my, my friend in the church, and he said, and both of them, both the missionaries and he said it was preposterous, and that, that was never the case and could never be the case. And I said, well, I'm glad you said that because if it were, um, I wouldn't have anything to do with this. It's, that's just absurd. And they gave me a quote from Joseph Fielding Smith, who I think was either the then prophet yeah. or was about, uh, was just uh, succeeded as the prophet. Maybe Harold B. Lee had taken over. I, I can't remember exactly. But, but um, where he said, I've heard this story before and I can't think of anything more absurd or ridiculous. Um, it's just not true. Yeah. Uh, he, he translated from the plates. Otherwise, what's the point of the plates? Why were they preserved? Uh, <laughs> you know, why why have a Urim and Thummim if you're not going to use it? You're just going to find some rock in a well. And, uh, I mean, I'm right. paraphrasing what he said. Yeah, but Joseph Filling Smith says that it was, it was an inferior um an inferior method, and he just couldn't grasp as to why Joseph Smith would use that instead of the Urim and Thummim. Therefore, he didn't believe that Joseph Smith used the rock and a hat. Yeah, right? you're you're familiar with the the quote. Yeah, it's anyway, in the Do doctrines of salvation on volume three. It is three. that's right. Yeah, it is that's right. Anyway, so with that quote, um, I thought, well, okay, okay. Then, as weird as all this is. And it was weird. Um, it still produces a pretty good result. You know, from what I can see, it's the sort of thing that I want um, in terms of its outcomes. Uh, I think they boasted a very low rate of divorce among people who are temple married. Uh, they, you know, the family home evening gave this very glossy, and I mean literally glossy, uh, version of family life. Um I thought, yeah, that's what that's what, really what I want. And so with that assurance, I was prepared to be uh, become a member. Yeah, and we'll come back to this, Neville, but I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, you're saying that if you, maybe if you had known all the accurate elements of Mormon church history, you you might maybe not have joined it as you did or when you did. On the other hand, I think you're also acknowledging that at some level, all religion, including even uh, the correlated version of Mormon history, defies logic at some level, and that really you weren't converting over the logic. You were converting over a lifestyle that you felt like Mormonism would offer you. Is that fair to say? 
uh, that's fair to say, coupled with that uh, perceived spiritual Pentecostal experience that I'd had, um, which just brought all of these weird teachings together into a package of prophecy. Um, so uh, with the assurance that it, I, I never felt comfortable about Joseph Smith at all. I have to say that's true. Um, I, I never really liked the idea of a, a prophet called Joseph Smith. It never gelled for me very well. But my my uh, uh, feeling ill at ease about that was placated, I think, uh, even eroded by all these other things that you just mentioned, John. So I got to a stage where I could live with that and, in fact, even eventually celebrate it as something that uh, uh, didn't disturb me nearly as much. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hard to work out um, precise causes and effects in these sorts of things because they're very nuanced. And um, there are so many little influences. But from that point forward, I just went as hard as I could to get a hold of that lifestyle as quickly as I could. I love it. Makes sense. And so did you, did you, what was the determining factor you sort of accepting Moroni's promise and, you know, Moroni 10, four pray, reading the book of Mormon, praying it and getting a spiritual witness, or did, did that decision come in some other way? I think in some other way, I, I, I was not your classical, uh, kneel down and ask whether the book of Mormon is true sort of guy. Um, it came in a number of ways. I mean, I, I checked out a lot of the claims about the restoration and modelling of the church through New Testament study. Um, I was fairly familiar with the New Testament. And so I, I think I approached it in a fairly academic way in that um, I made extensive notes on what Paul had said about uh, the foundation of the church being on uh, uh, apostles, prophets, etc., and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Um, there was a lot of uh, interlocking and dovetailing of concepts from church teaching, missionary discussions, New Testament study. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't really say that the Book of Mormon, while while I didn't uh, disregard it, it wasn't instrumental in my conversion. It was more a New Testament, Old Testament. Uh, spiritual experience with the Isaiah 29 type of process rather than uh, just one night kneeling down by my bed and saying, I'm checking out Moroni's promise here. God, is it true? Um, so it was, it was uh, incremental. Uh, it was gradual, but it was pretty solid too. How how much of it would you say was social, or s social or emotional, versus spiritual? Because I I kind of have a theory that most conversions are primarily social and emotional, and maybe secondarily in a you know or tertiarily <laughs> intellectual. Was it was it a was it largely a social or emotional conversion? No. Well, I'm probably a bit influenced by David Hume because he says that. Where although we like to give the semblance of rationality as humans, we're really emotional beings in our decision making. And I, I think that's right. I think we like to dress up things as having been uh, logical, but I think that's an ex post facto set of rationalizations for what are really emotional decisions where we go with where our desires lead us. And uh, hopefully there's some rationality to back it up. And I think that's true of me with my conversion that it certainly was emotional. I had I had a lot that I really wanted to be uh, backfilled into my life but wasn't there. And um, I rationalised to myself that the Mormon church was there, but I'd had these spiritual experiences which turned out to be emotional experiences in any event. But I had those that um, I think brought me, brought me to a place where I was right for the picking in terms of uh, uh, conversion. I love it. It's so great. Okay. 
So anything you want to share about your baptism or your conversion or what happened after that? It was pretty lackluster, the baptismal experience, I've got to say. Um, what had happened was uh, my parents were firmly opposed to my joining the church. Uh, so I was what they call a dry Mormon for a couple of years. And then... Uh, I, I don't what, what do you mean? By, tell us what you mean by that, for those who don't know. Well, uh, what I, I was living living all the principles and acting as if I were a Mormon, but because I wasn't allowed to be baptized, um, I um, wasn't officially a member of the church. And uh, uh, But then then some events that I won't bother going into uh, occurred where I had the opportunity to, to leave home, which I had to do because my parents said you'd never be a Mormon under our roof, uh, travel into state, get baptized, and um, that's, it was all just a, um, it was a pretty lackluster uh, non-event in a way. I, I don't want to be disrespectful about the ordinances, but it wasn't anywhere as near as, spirit, as special as those types of spiritual experience that I was enjoying um, before I actually joined the church. Okay. And so uh, baptism was a tiny bit anticlimactic. Yeah. And yeah. your parents and weren't super excited. No. Well, they were excited, but not, not enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, oftentimes from a non-Mormon parent perspective, you know, and this is an offensive term to use, at least in the United States, like, from a non-Mormon's perspective, especially parents, it's like, my kids are joining a cult. A cult is... Is, is stealing my child from me. And that's not to call the Mormon church a cult. It's just to convey. And I'm guessing in Australia, it might even be worse than in the United States. I, I think it's, I think it's uh, very different again here. Just another uh, layer added to that because uh, where is the, the Mormon church in the United States has some uh, prestige, some presence, some level of acceptability uh, certainly back at the time that we're talking about, in the uh, 70s, uh, it had none of that here in Australia. And my mother had a cousin who had joined the church who became a very prominent member in the, uh, in the church in New Zealand. And, in fact, he, uh, he was the principal of the church college in New Zealand. But uh, uh, she had a lot of anecdotes that she thought were pretty weird about him and his family, and she didn't want my uh, having any part of that to be uh, part of my experience. So, yeah, the, but they were, I mean, these these were not um, sophisticated people, my parents. They were pretty visceral in their reaction to things. So yeah. it wasn't like I could sit down with them and reason with them. It was, there was a lot of yelling and screaming about this stuff, and it wasn't pleasant. So... I made a lot of sacrifices to join the church. And for a while, when I, when I, my relationship with the church uh, changed, I've got to say I was pretty angry because, uh, I mean, I'm not angry now. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. But at that time, I was a bit angry because I thought, Gee, I've given up a lot for this. And it turns out to be a bag of beans. You know, it's just... It's just uh, not worth the sacrifice that I made. Now, uh, again, that's something we can probably return to a little later. But, uh, um, you know, I, I made some pretty significant sacrifices for what I believe to be true. Um, and they were emotional sacrifices as much as, uh, as temporal or physical sacrifices. I was really severing relationships with my family, such as it was. I mean, I still loved my parents, even though they were... They were crazy. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a neurotic. My brother was a habitual drug user. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, and I, and I was none of those things. I was, I was just different. I was different in every way from the rest of my family, and that made me sort of a weird, quirky kid anyway. And they, they, uh, they like other people in my um, environment 
made me feel uncomfortable about those things. So, yeah, it it, it comes at a cost. And um, the question always is with cost-benefit analyses, is it worth it in the end? And uh, I, I, think, I think looking back on it, yes, it was worth it, really. The whole thing has been worth it. Uh, weaving it into the uh, whoop and wharf of my life, it's been tremendous. Uh, but it's just not what I thought it was. And uh, so my relationship has had to change. So let's talk about what Mormonism brought to you and what your Mormon experience was like. Because you could you could probably say you turned out pretty well, especially relative to other people who were your peers or other family members. And it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just predict that what I'm going to say at the end is, hey, you turned out pretty well, Neville, and, and it's hard to say the church didn't have a positive influence. So let's talk about the positive yeah. and negative influences of Mormonism in your life after you converted. H happy to do that because it is true that um, it has been a very positive influence in my life in many ways. Uh, and I think, I think the first positive influence, uh, I, 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 after I was baptized, I served a short mission in Tasmania um, uh, working as what they then called a building missionary. Uh, I had to come home because I was injured. Uh, I, I broke my foot on a work site. But, uh, uh, and, in fact, my parents accepted me back into their home after that, which was sort of funny after all the acrimony that we'd been through. But uh, I served a building mission. Um, while I was in law school, I was, I was in my... Sure, I'm not sure people know what a building mission is because I don't yeah, know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think most Mormons know anymore yeah. because I, they don't exist. But um, <clears throat> what I did was I I, uh, I was asked by my bishop to volunteer as a, as a building missionary and I worked on the reconstruction of a chapel down in Tasmania. Um, and you work under a supervisor. Uh, you don't have a companion as such. But um, what I did, because uh, I was mad keen as a, as a new convert, I went out with the full-time missionaries, the ordinary proselytizing missionaries, as an off often as I could uh, to engage in teaching and tracting and the like in my hours off work. But um, normally you can just uh, live a fairly normal life out of, uh, out of work hours. But, yeah, I... I, I did some building work on the Glen Huon Chapel in Tasmania. Okay. And that was before serving a traditional Mormon mission, right? Yeah, yeah. So then then uh, I came home. Um, then I, then I uh, enrolled in law school, um, had a great time uh, with my friends, with the uh, student body. I, I, the, the thing about... Uh, university and law school for me was that I learned for the first time in my life that there were rich people. I, <laughs> I just I just hadn't experienced that. But just about everybody uh, at law school came from uh, very wealthy families and from private schools, and uh, I was probably one of the two or three in my in my year that uh, uh, hadn't been to a private school. Um, but I was adopted into their into their friendship circles. Uh, I uh, formed fast friendships that I still enjoy today, um, and it. I think all the interests that I'd had as a teenager, I could just indulge to their absolute limit. <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> because of the university environment, and. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that was great. But then, then I qualified for what we call an honours year. I, excuse me, I've just got a drink here. No worries. This is so. Uh, this is so fun. <clears throat> I'm loving it. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So I I qualified for what we call an honours year, which is where the the top uh, five percent of a of a class get to write an honours thesis. <clears throat> Under supervision of one of the one of the professors, and um, uh, it's sort of a very prestigious thing to be invited to do. And uh, so I, oh, I'm sorry about this, John. <coughs> no worries. 
I've got a, that plaguing frog in the throat. <laughs> um, I uh, so I was invited to do that. I and uh, at the same time, I was feeling pretty bad about having not served a full time mission, the traditional mission. And uh, I prayed about it, and then I got this. Uh, ne this Neville, um, can you, for our non Mormon listeners, can you talk a little bit about um, your feelings around not serving a mission? What that's like in the church? Why is that important? Sure. Uh, um, is, are I mean, there are when they don't serve a mission. Yeah, there, there are. If they're not officially mandated, there are certainly socially uh, expected steps in the pathway for a young Mormon man. Uh, the first thing is to be ordained an elder, which is receiving what's called the Melchizedek priesthood. Um, the next thing after that is to serve a mission, which is where the prophet of the church allocates you to some area of service in the world where you uh, proselytize and uh, the missionaries on bikes, the guys who knock on the doors, um, those guys, are, are, and, and indeed the ladies as well, they've all gone through that process of being called on a mission. And uh, I hadn't made myself available for that service, and I was feeling a bit guilty about that because I'd, I was, well, sort of... Uh, Yeah, I felt that that was a thing that was missing in my life. So I was praying about it, and uh, I got this, what I considered at the time to be an answer, that um, uh, you can go on a mission anytime you like, but this is the last time I'm calling you. I thought that was a voice from heaven telling me that. So I went straight away to see the bishop. He, uh, he uh, got the paper process going, and um, then in due course I was... I was called to serve in the Germany Hamburg mission. Um, that was great for me because I'd never been out of the country. I, I'd never experienced anything of travel or any of those things that um, that could be so life changing. So, did you speak um, German? Did you speak German? No. Oh. No. No. Um, so yeah, it was. Although I have have a very strong German ancestry. Um, the genealogy of our family, uh, well, my family, is um, Danish, predominantly German, and a little bit of English. So we're very Northern European. You um, can probably tell that by looking at me. <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> so um, that was the next heartbreak for my family, that um, here I was being offered a prestigious uh, opportunity at the university, And uh, I was going to knock that back and go off and serve a, serve a Mormon mission. And uh, they couldn't uh, accept that. Uh, there's a lot of entanglement that could go through on that. But um, anyway, uh, the short of it is that uh, I accepted the call. I postponed my honors year for two years and went to uh, Germany, Hamburg. And... Um, That was, I think... Don't want... Sorry? No, keep, sorry, keep going. I thought somebody called me. Oh, no. um, <clears throat> the, um, that was completely life-changing. Um, when I arrived in Germany, I decided, okay, this is home for the next two years, and I'm just going to love it. And I did. I loved the German people. Although I didn't speak German, I'd read a lot of German literature and translation, and... Because the Germans generally are so cerebral, that stood me in good stead in, in general conversation. The fact that I played chess pretty well, they loved that because they're great chess players. And uh, I just had this fantastic experience of uh, being, I guess, inculcated in a, in a new culture that was so rich and had such a long history and, and was part of my history. Um, So that that was a that was good and that satisfied. Um, I, I think I made that division between the intellectual and the spiritual before. That was certainly very appealing to my intellectual self. Um, I just enjoyed it. I had 
very early a companion who was who was German. He was an older guy. He had already finished his university training. And um, he and I just hit it off so well. We we got along so well. But he trained me in my German. We'd, we'd speak German all day. And I'd help him with his English at night. And, um, and he said, you know, he hadn't been able to find a companion that knew anything about uh, English grammar. And I said, well, grammar's easy. I, I, I know that. And so um, I was able to help him with grammar. And, uh, and at the end of our couple of months together, uh, we couldn't tell. We really couldn't tell whether we were speaking English or German. And uh, I'd quite often go on the doors and people would say, which part of Germany are you from? Because he trained me in the right accent and uh, uh, the right inflections and gave me a few colloquialisms that I could throw into my, my speech. And so my, my German... Well, it was good when I got out of the MTC. I think I had a fairly high FSI score uh, when I left the MTC. But by the time I'd finished with him, um, I, I remember sitting in church one day and I thought, gee, I understand everything they're saying, everything. <laughs> I, I get this. <laughs> I, and I can say everything I want to say. <laughs> and it, it was just, it was just uh, uh, marvellous. So... But then, then the other thing was that I served with a lot of um, uh, American companions who um, they were, and some of them are still my friends today again, uh, who um, had been raised in good families. And I was learning how the dynamics of Mormonism uh, is implemented, how it's practiced, what the, what the praxis is for a family how you uh how mormonism is done uh and you know like blessings on the food and morning and evening prayer and those sorts of things that are natural to people who've been raised in the church but were things that i had yet to learn and i picked up a lot of that sort of thing from from my companions and and uh, their tales of their families and things like that and i I started to get a good picture of how a Mormon family might be. So that was all very, very good for me. Um, and and the, the German people, I found very accepting of me. They, they loved me and I loved them. So I, I had um, no experiences as a, as a missionary that I just didn't love. I mean, I didn't enjoy tracting very much, but, you know, that, that just was part of the, the deal. Um, and I also got to see a lot of Germany because uh, to, uh, for the last seven months of my mission, I was what they call an assistant to the president, which is where I, I could travel with him, uh, him uh, my, me and my companion. Uh, both of us would get to travel with the president uh, to the various parts of the mission. Um, we also had to go through what was then called the zone, which was the uh, communist part of Germany, so I went through that several times. I was, uh, I'm probably one of the few people in any room that got arrested at Checkpoint Charlie. <laughs> um, I, I, I managed to somehow get out of that, uh, that tangle, but I got arrested uh, there for um, having spoken with, a, with some uh, uh, native communist Germans. So yeah, that was, that was fun. But yeah, it was a great experience. Um, and uh, I came home. In fact, I came home, and I did start my honors thesis a few about a week after I got home. And I, I found that I could no longer read English properly. Hmm. I, I remember I was sitting sitting in the law library, reading a law report, and I read a page over and over, and I just couldn't understand it. The language language was too complicated. It was just too hard. And I, I just walked out in tears. I thought, gee, um, I used to be very good at English and I'm not anymore. But uh, everything started to come together and I, I settled in. And um, when I came home, uh, I, uh, my wife Penny was still on her mission in Italy. And uh, eventually I proposed to her. We got married the following year and the rest is, as they say, history. I love it. 
All right. Yeah. I think for so many of us, that Mormon mission is such a formative experience. And, uh, and that temple marriage is such a formative experience. And I was, a, I think I was a successful missionary and I didn't make assistant to the president. So I think, you know, you sharing with us that you did a- achieve that level of service just testifies to how committed uh, you were as, as wanting to be a devout, hardworking, faithful, obedient, righteous, committed Latter-day Saint. True. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, that that's it that that's really it um yeah so penny and i got married in 1983 uh we were sealed in the new, Ze- new zealand temple um and i think she'd been raised in the church and i think that's where i really started to realize that some of the, the dysfunctionality of my my uh nuclear family had still survived in me despite all the conversion process and all the experiences I'd been through. And so uh, I I was really indebted to her to pointing out a lot of things that were just quirks that I'd brought with me from my previous life as a non-member and as a fairly unhappy non-member. So we we had, um, you know, we had, I had to learn a lot in the first year or two and she was a very patient teacher. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, but I think in those early days, um, Penny and I hmm, probably realised that while we were absolutely uh, committed, devout, tithe-paying, card-carrying members of the church, absolutely devoted, never say no to a calling, do whatever you're supposed to do, uh, serve, whatever, that uh, both of us realised that what I call uh, retail Mormonism was not quite for us. Um, Mm. We wanted something a little more, a little more challenging, and we were a bit isolated out here in Australia because there was no one, I won't say there was no one, but there were few and far people... uh, uh, the few and far between people who can talk with you about some of the more interesting areas of the gospel and history and, and uh, the church. And so um, I, I'm not sure how I hit upon it, but I said, why don't we subscribe to uh, Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, which, was, which gave us sort of a, another angle on the way the church worked and the way other people thought about it. So that brought us into a community um, of thinkers within the church. And uh, that was, for us, quite satisfying in those early years. Uh, I remember I was at at work one day and Penny called me up and said, Neville, the first dialogue, dialogue has just come and I've just read the first article. Let me tell you all about it. And she was so excited to to share it all with me. And um, so we we had a very enjoyable life where we had our routine um, retail type of uh, stuff that we were doing in the church, enjoying the fellowship of the members, um, uh, participating in activities, attending church on Sunday, paying our tithing, etc. But then we had this other stuff that we could get into and and look into and uh, and think about and challenge each other with and say what if and what about and um, that was that was a lot of fun. So really, I'd I'd reached nirvana, if you will. I, I was very very happy. And then our first uh, daughter came along fairly quickly. Neville, Neville, can I ask you really quickly a, qu- a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so dialogue journal. So for our non-Mormon uh, listeners, I just included a link to it. We'll include it in the show notes. I just pasted it in the comments. Think For those of you who don't, and, and there's a lot of, I'd say most Mormons have no idea what Dialogue Journal even is. And so I'll just summarize that basically in the mid to late 1960s, a group of faithful Mormon scholars got together, people like Eugene England and, and uh, I would say people like Leonard Arrington, 
and Bob Reese and others, even down. And don't don't leave that down. I was yeah. going to say that. Yeah. Down a jokes are current number two Mormon in the world. The first presidency, first <laughs> counselor in the Mormon first presidency. They start a dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, which was intended to be an academic journal where Mormonism could be discussed academically, intellectually, scientifically, but also faithfully. And over the years, uh, you know, dialogues talked about feminism. They've talked about racism. They've talked about the Book of Mormon and science and evolution and, you know, Book of Mormon historicity and just any of the controversies that ended up that, that Fawn Brody re revealed in, in 1945 in her book, No Man Knows My History, any of the things that ended up in the CES letter or the gospel topics essays were covered in depth in excruciating and loving, delightful detail in the dialogue journal, which came out quarterly and continues to come out quarterly for four or five decades. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I just have to ask you, like, so we're talking about the 1980s, which is right when they'd be talking about B.H. Roberts and, you know, Book of Abraham stuff and just all of the big controversies. So you, you and Penny are faithful Australian Mormons, and you're like subscribing to dialogue and giddy to receive your first copy. Like that's almost kind of <laughs> mind blowing to me. Can you talk to us about like, how was that? How are you faithful and reading dialogue and why were you even curious about dialogue? Because so many, you know, even the church by the late eighties, early nineties had denounced both dialogue and sunstone as being dangerous. So I'm just trying to imagine a world where you guys are faithful Australian Latter-day Saints and giddy to receive your first copy of this journal that the church ends up condemning as as uh, an enemy to faith. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it, that's a hard question. That's a hard question to answer because it's it's almost like there was this. Um, I, I, I've got a lot of filing cabinets in my head, and um, uh, I, I remember when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I was very young. I was uh, I was probably six or seven, and um, I was really into paleontology. I know that's really popular now with uh, young kids. Every kid likes dinosaurs and fossils and everything. But back in those days, that was a little more rare. It was a little more uh, eccentric to be so turned on by by those sorts of things. And um, I, I I just assumed without even thinking about it, the theory of evolution was correct, but I also believed in Genesis. How do you do that? And uh, uh, we had a, a large Catholic family that lived across the street from us, and uh, they had 10 kids, and one of the kids that was my age said, um, how can you believe in the Bible and believe in dinosaurs? And... That question had never occurred to me, um, and I just, I just, from that time on, I just kept separate separate compartments. So there was, I think, uh, coming, moving fast forward to our early married life with dialogue. I think what it was was we were absolutely committed at the faith level to the church, and uh, did all the things we had to do, and had no compunctions about doing those things. We were returned missionaries. We were married in the temple. We did the stuff that covenants uh, told you you had to do. Um, but we couldn't put our brains into suspended animation, so we needed some stimulation. And so when when questions came up in dialogue, I don't think it ever registered with me that they were threats to the believability of the church. I just, I just stored those away in that little dialogue uh, filing cabinet um, open that up to enjoy that, close that when I was uh, about to go back and uh, do faithful service and teach elders quorum or high priest quorum or whatever I had to do. Not it. a very good explanation, I know, but that's that's the best I can come up with. No, it's, just, it's actually an amazing explanation because nowadays it seems, well, it seems like the church is really torn and it has been at battle with itself because... 
on the one hand, it, it seems like, uh, you know, for, for decades and decades, whether it's Joseph Fielding Smith or Bruce R. McConkie, you know, or Boyd K. Packer, these sort of orthodox, fundamentalist, conservative Mormon church leaders, Bruce R. McConkie, that they that they felt like intellectuality is antithetical to devout Mormonism, that science is an enemy to faith, that reason is an intellectual, is, is, that reason is antithetical to faith, and that you have to stomp out the intellectuals. And that's why they denounced dialogue, they denounced Sunstone, they excommunicated the September 6th, they've mm -hmm. excommunicated so many other people, thinking that that's what they needed to do to preserve faith. And mm -hmm. I can get yeah. why they did that. I don't think that's unique to Mormonism. On the other hand, what I hear you saying is, is I hear you saying two things that number one, uh, that, that you needed, you needed a place to be able to explore intellectual things, scientific things, you and Penny, you needed that. And that dialogue, the very thing that the church ended up condemning was actually an important part of your remaining faithful in the church. Uh, and that's what I heard with Mormon stories for so many years before they excommunicated me. And that's what I heard about Bill Real and so many other. And so I, I don't know. It's making me wonder whether the, sometimes I feel like the church did the right thing, that by condemning intellectual enterprises, they were preserving people's devotion to the church. But in your case... I'm hearing that dialogue, things like dialogue, was actually helping you and Penny stay faithful. Is that is that true or fair to say? It's fair to say, with a couple of a uh, couple of, uh, I guess, qualifications on boundaries. Uh, so we had concluded from what we'd heard, not from what we'd read, that uh, Sunstone would be a step too far for us. So we never subscribed to Sunstone. And we actually did cancel our subscription to Dialogue when that condemnation started, when the church was saying, you can't be reading that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't be reading that stuff. So we stopped because we were faithful members, but we felt the loss. But Dialogue also brought it upon itself uh, uh, for us as well. Because as they change editors, so the so the uh, the camber of the thought changes as well as you would well know, and they brought in some editors that were really into, and this is after the September six. We we grieved and were shocked at their excommunications. We because we they'd become they didn't know this, but they'd become our friends, <laughs> and uh, when they were excommunicated, that that troubled us. But um, not troubled in the, that we were questioning the church. We just thought, whoa, we can't go too far here. We're going to be a bit careful. And um, then when the editor changed to start bringing in uh, praying to Mother in Heaven and uh, those sorts of themes, we thought, yeah, you know, this is, this is really offbeat. I don't find this intellectually interesting. Uh, it's not going into any history. It's going into realms of... Uh, theological speculation uh, we don't need it and so we stopped it and it was about that time that uh, I started getting called into responsible positions I was called into the high council the uh, the bishopric then I was called as a bishop um, before that I'd been called as a 70 um, and I became the state mission president so we were getting busier and busier and we had less time to spend reading things like dialogue or other books. Um, so in a way, service overtook us and we just got busy. We had no time for questions. We had no time for things. Um, Penny was a state relief society president. Um, I, was, I was then uh, the bishop. And then uh, soon after that, I was called into the state presidency. Um, then after the state presidency, I was called uh, uh, for a long time into public affairs. And I was the sort of guy that they 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 all hated behind the scenes because I was this intellectual lawyer, um, too big for my boots, they probably thought. Um, but I was also the sort of guy that they wanted to wheel out 
when they needed to make some good public impression. So there was this uh, schizoid approach that the church adopted towards me. They they got more and more tired of my intellectualizing when I'd ask the hard questions of policy decisions or programs or whatever, but they loved uh, boasting about the fact that they had uh, this barrister in their midst that, uh, you know, was a pretty smart guy and could uh, talk to most people about most things. Yeah. yeah. If I can say something about the dialogue question, John, um, I think it just speaks uh, to the blinders and you know, or the Mormon bubble that you always talk about. You know, how people, I think at some point, even me, I, I, I heard about um, Joseph Smith's polygamy and I, I just ignored it. Uh, just watching uh, a couple of days ago, Randy Bell's um, interview, you know, he freaking had dinner with Todd Compton and knew about the research he had done about polygamy and it just didn't face him until he saw it on the LDS website on the church gospel topic essays. So it's just really <laughs> interesting how Neville has, uh, you know, like the, the additions of, of dialogue and it, it's not, it's like, it's not facing him like any of the big issues that were being discussed at the time. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's yeah, right. That's exactly right. right. Sorry, John. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a particularly Mormon trait to compartmentalize. I think humans are master compartmentalizers. And I think confirmation bias is a human condition, a human phenomenon, not a Mormon phenomenon. And so, you know, you just, you, you live life, you, you follow what's working, you follow what's, uh, what's make bringing you joy and providing you meaning and purpose. You gather the evidence wherever it comes from that makes you feel good about the choices, the path you're on and the choices you're making. You kind of ignore and, and, and turn your eye and your face away from any evidence that would cause you any dissonance or problems even if that evidence is right there staring you in the face or on your coffee table, as it were. And, and then you add to that, the Mormon church does such a good job of keeping everyone really busy. They, they get you in a Bishop, you know, they get you to Bishop Rick. You're serving as a Bishop. You're in state high councils. You've got kids and you've got a successful career and life's too busy to, you know, it's like life's too busy to get distracted. Right. That's that's exactly how it was. Yeah. And look, I, I read all about the polyandry and the polygamy um, in the early uh, days of the church with Joseph Smith. And and as was just said a moment ago, you know, it didn't register me as being a problem. I thought, well, there's just the evolution of the whole thing. It's part of the workout. It didn't occur to me at the time that Joseph Smith was a scoundrel. Um, I guess probably because the detail hadn't been fleshed out sufficiently in some of these articles. It was just like there were some anomalous things in church history. And, okay, well, I'll think about that at some stage. So, uh, you know, really what we're doing, what we're doing is we're, we have all these little questions that bubble up and you sort of relegate them to the too hard pile. I don't have time pile uh, at the time. You think I'll come back to that and I'll get that sorted because I'm sure because of my spiritual witness that the church is true, that there's going to be an answer to it and I just don't have it right now. So I'm not going to get bent out of shape over something that I can't explain for the moment because there will be an explanation. I have deep conviction of that and the brethren are assuring us that that is true. I believe of them. I believe that of them because they're prophets, seers and revelators. And so I just, I just swallowed the Kool-Aid and um, went on pretty happily. Yeah. 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 And so I, I'm guessing if you were to draw a pie chart of all the things you learned through the gospel topics essays or CES letter or Mormon stories or whatever your ultimate sources were that might have taken you out of the church, how much of that did you already know from your exposure to dialogue in the 80s? If you can even make that calculation, I just have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most people become lawyers because they're poor mathematicians. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, look, I, I don't think I don't think the gospel topics essays told us much new. Um, not a great deal new. We we had 
heard or knew about most of it. And in fact, we were helping other people with these sorts of questions because, because we were considered the repository of all things weird and hard with the church. And so um, young single adults or wayward people would be referred to me or Penny to help counsel them through their trials of faith before before trials of faith became a thing that they are now. You know, so this is just the odd random person that had read something in uh, maybe Fawn Brody or whatever. And I mean, I, I read Fawn Brody. Um, I remember I remember how this happened. Uh, Penny gave me two books by Fawn Brody, one her biography of uh, Jefferson, and the other one, the other one was uh, uh, No Man Knows My History for a birthday present. And I, I looked at Fawn Brody's uh, No Man Knows My History and I said, are you sure that you want to give me this? Don't, don't you know what the church has said about this and how we're supposed to stay away from it? And she said, I think you can handle it. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and so, so I read it and, and it was all, so, um, you know, I took it in the same stride as I'd taken things that I'd learned in dialogue. I thought, Oh, that's a bit weird, and uh, and I I actually in those days collected BYU studies, and so I I checked up on some of the things she said uh, in her book, and I thought eh, maybe she's uh, stretching the limits here a bit. That's her opinion. So I I found ways to minimise what wow. she was saying, and uh, and just sort of uh, go on as if she hadn't said it. But still, it registered in my mind that it had been said. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how I got through all this being so blasé. I mean, when we come to gay marriage, uh, same-sex marriage, I, I've been through a, a similar process, and we'll talk about that uh, soon, I hope. But uh, yeah, I, I, maybe I'm just not a very nice person, and I don't think deeply enough about things. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's great, and. I'm dying to hear what it was that in the recent times that really flipped the bit for you, as they say in the development. Yeah. Business. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in the chronology. No, no. Okay. So okay. Uh, thank, thanks for letting us kind of, but it's fascinating that you not only were reading dialogue in the eighties, but you freaking read no man knows by history, <laughs> which is 98, which is 80% of what's in the CES letter. <laughs> yeah. you, were reading, you were reading that in the eighties and it didn't even phase you. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I think it basically comes down to my being just dumb and amoral. No, no, it's. I mean, it's it's probably a combination of the church was working for you, and the church does a really good job of, let's just say, immunizing its own members to truth. That that's that's precisely that's precisely what it was, um, and and I had been trained to be a skeptic of. Uh, Fawn Brody before I even opened the book. Mm. You know, that that inculcation had been thorough. Um, you know, don't ever read uh, No Man Knows My History, You'll Leave the Church. And, you know, Satan sat at her elbow when she wrote it and <laughs> she was excommunicated and yada, 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 you know, uh, just don't do it. And that's why I was, I was a bit surprised when Penny gave it to me. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I was very pleased I, I, because of the confidence she was showing in my ability to to take on the hard stuff and not be uh, destroyed by it. Yeah, it, but it, see, it wasn't just church things that were destroying, uh, that were leaving little niggles. And I have to admit that some of the things she said niggled and open that filing cabinet drawer, put it in there, I'll come back to it later. But I was reading things by... Uh, 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 John John Jay Gould, uh, who's a paleontologist at Harvard, I was reading a lot of uh, his scientific work, and there was one book I think it's called Time's Arrow, where he said it's impossible, it's just impossible that there was enough water on the Earth for the Noah uh, myth to have occurred, and you know it hit me for the first time that there were questions about the Bible and about the Old Testament and that maybe it doesn't square up with, with scientific uh, research. And I thought, 
Nah, there's got to be an answer on that one. Open up that old filing cabinet drawer, whack, put it in there, and I'll come back to that later. But bit by bit, lots of things that I was reading both in relation to the church and also that I was reading just in my general reading uh, were sort of challenging faith in little ways. And at some stage I knew I'd have to open that filing cabinet, pull out all those files, put them on the table and go through them one by one. But that time wasn't then because I was too busy serving the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so you served as a bishop, you served in stake presidencies, and you served in mission presidencies, and those are all, I mean, stopping short of becoming a Mormon apostle or general authority, that's like right, that's like right under there. You you reached, I would say, some of the highest levels of church leadership in the country of Australia, short of actually becoming an area authority or a general authority. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And and the same thing was true of our mission in Brussels. I mean, we were working with uh, general authorities all the time. And when I was working, uh, uh, well, fast forward, if you don't mind my doing so, John, um, in 2013 and 14, we were called on, uh, it wasn't formally called a mission, but it was a full-time mission. Uh, and we were called to be the... Uh, the National direct Interfaith Directors, Penny and I were called to do that. And I spoke to the area president, which was Jim Hamuller at the time. I uh, and whoa, he and I, whoa, 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 that's a big name. James yeah. Hamula is the Mormon general authority who was excommunicated yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. For, well, he, was area, uh, he was area president at the time, and yeah. he, were, he and I were good friends. Yeah. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and I think he'd acknowledge it, that, we're, that we were friends and we got along well. Anyway, when he when he called me to do this, when he called us to do this, I said, what does that mean? You know, what's an interfaith director? I've never heard of that. Um, and he said, basically, Neville, it's uh, whatever we want Neville to do. <laughs> and so that's what they did. They got me to troubleshoot. They got me to go to um, meetings with non-members. They got me. And our big project that we were working on was to do a, uh, an econometric study of the contribution that religion made to Australian society. Now, the agenda behind that, if one is to be honest, was to continue the tax deductibility of tithing in Australia. So that they had some resource upon which they could call, but what they wanted to do, because they knew that the Mormons alone would never make that case, they got us to gather together a council of experts, uh, economists, uh, econometricians, uh, uh, theologians, uh, people from all different walks of professional life that would be relevant to this from different faiths. The Catholics were represented, the Jews were represented, uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, I think, from memory were. Uh, certainly the uh, Uniting Church was... Uh, involved the Anglicans, we were working closely with them. Um, this group was to come up with a set of instructions for Deloitte to prepare this report on how religion was a plus in society. And so that's that's basically what we did for a couple of years, um, working on that. So that that um, that kept us busy again. Neville, but, is there is there anything you want to say about what it was like to be a Mormon bishop or in a Mormon stake presidency in terms of, you know, the problems or the blessings, the good or the bad of? Yeah, of, I, I, of, I'd, so I'd like to come back to that. Okay, yeah, okay. I'd, go ahead. I, 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 I just okay. can we just yeah. sort of have that as a sidebar, and I'll yeah. come back to that in a second because um, I, when I when I was working in this calling, I, I got to, you know, I got to introduce uh, Elder Cook, for example to the Archbishop of Sydney. Um, I, I worked closely with a number of, you know, high-ranking church officials during this time. This is Mormon Apostle Quentin Cook, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, okay. we, all got to be, we got to be friends. We were friendly with all these people. So, you know, in terms of faithfulness or dedication to the church, no, no space to think of anything other than that. Um, 
we were right at the, the coal face and we were chipping away very hard. But but just going back to your question, John, about being a bishop and being in state presidencies and and um, uh, and presidency, I'd like to sep separate because that's a that's a different thing. Sure, uh, something pretty disastrous happened during that time. But um, <clears throat> I, um, I I think the first year of being a bishop, I had a hard time because <clears throat> I didn't really. This is where I was really being forced to implement retail Mormonism rather than just being able to believe it, uh, practice it as far as I needed to, but then have my own little reserve. <clears throat> and uh, so during that time, um, that first year, I found it pretty difficult. Then I read a book by Dallin Oaks called The Lord's Way. Now, I'd, I'd known Dallin Oaks for some time. When I was thinking about a legal career, and before I became a barrister, I worked for a period for an international law firm by the name of Baker and McKenzie. You might have heard of them. Sure. Uh, they're, yeah. They're an American deal. firm. They're a big deal. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I was a bit, bit nervous about committing myself to um, a big international firm like that. So I, I actually wrote to Delman Oaks, I, just out of the blue. I wrote to him and I said, you know, I'm thinking about this and, you know, what, what's your counsel to me? And he wrote back and uh, he said, oh, you know, I think it's a good move. And, you know, I've got a friend of mine who's a member of the firm. He's a good lawyer. Uh, that happened to be Bill Atkin, who um, in due course would become a good friend of mine as the international uh, legal counsel for the church. And, you know, to this day, I think Bill Atkin is one of the one of the very good LDS lawyers. He's he's a, got a great legal mind. But anyway, uh, so Dallin Oaks wrote back to me and. I went to uh, work at, uh, uh, so I, I, I got to know a number of general authorities over that time, and it never occurred to me that there was anything weird or uh, out of keeping with their apostolic calling that they were doing. That was, it was all pretty good fun. I just loved it. But, but um, in terms of the, the working in the state presidency, I didn't like that time at all. Um, uh, I, I just didn't like the structuralism. I didn't enjoy the uh, the way in which people were treated in stakes. I just don't like the whole idea of this hierarchical thing. I knew I had to do it. I did it, and I did it with vigor and fervor. But my heart really wasn't in that sort of thing. I didn't like that at all. Um, as bishop, I had more more license to do my own thing. But after reading that book by Dallin Oaks, um, I started doing by the book and uh, I did it so much by the book that they called me into the state presidency. Then um, I did that for five years. And then because, I think they must have detected that I wasn't enjoying it because I was basically put out to pasture for a few years. I just, I had nothing to do. They didn't know what to do with me. Um, I was, uh, I think uh, I was considered Neville, a bit on the nose. Yep. Well, what were some of the parts? I mean, you talked about the hierarchy, um, but what were some of the parts that you didn't like, that you were not enjoying? Uh, can you give some examples? You mentioned how people are being treated. Is that bishops uh, who are being uh, treated badly by the sake presidency or... I don't know, like, uh, was it disciplinary, also disciplinary councils? Did you have, yeah, that's what I was yeah, say. yeah. <clears throat> I didn't enjoy disciplinary councils very much. I, even though I'd held a number of disciplinary councils of, as a bishop, um, and I did so because I thought that was the right thing to do, um, I, I just don't like that sort of process very much where. A people, a bunch of people who are really your peers, are set up in judgment against individuals. It, it's a medieval concept. It's, um, you know, it, it it was redolent to me of um, of uh, uh, the Catholic Church during the medieval period. You know, with the um, uh, the Inquisition and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> the the other thing was. Overall, people have got no privacy whatsoever. They 
they have to tell everything to a bishop that they ask. They have to tell everything to the stake president or the member of the stake presidency that they ask. There's no saying, well, that's none of your business because everything is your business. It, it felt weird. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, it feels evil to me. <clears throat> but you have no, you have no way of, um, of, you know, your your bedroom life is not a secret because they can ask you about that. Your uh, family life is not a secret because they can ask you about that. Now, in some ways, it's a good thing because when there are evil things going down in a family, it's good that. It's good to some extent that a church can intervene and step in. But, um, yeah, um, <clears throat> and when I was, a couple of times I was engaged to act for bishops and stake presidents in court um, uh, where documents might be subpoenaed from a disciplinary council or whatever, and my job was to resist the subpoena and, and do that. Um I found that there was this sort of uh, power surge that went through the minds of a lot of these guys who were called to these things. And um, one of my favourite LDS scriptures is section 121. Uh, I, I still love that scripture to this day, you know. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood. You know, only by principles of love and concern and charity. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think I think all that just sit ba sat, uh, sit sit badly with me. I think um, I, although the stake president was a nice guy, I think underneath it he was a he was a fanatic. He was a he was, I think, basically a dangerous person. Who was the stake the president. president? Oh, yeah. Hmm. And you should well, the kind of people that end up being stake presidents, right? Like the the ones Sorry. that are really, those are the kind of people that end up being stake presidents or end up having those church callings. The ones that go by the book, the ones that are willing to follow, you know, what what the handbook says, um, and or willing to follow the process and follow the brethren where, where, wherever it takes them. Yeah, the term they use, which um, most people wouldn't be familiar with, is uh, they're aligned. They're aligned with the brethren. They'll do what they've got to do. And uh, it's a positive thing to be told you're aligned or to say of somebody that they're aligned, um, <laughs> <clears throat> which is for the Connor he, he he's in the club. He's He does what we, we ask him to do. Right. Yeah, it means you do respect <clears throat> the, the authority. That's what it means. It, it means, yeah, that's exactly it. See, when, when, we're, when I was working... Um, in that uh, in that calling as the national director for uh, for interfaith, the thing that I found was that I got to see the uh, brethren at a more human and sensible level rather than their hierarchical level. So I enjoyed that. That was great. You know, we could have conversations, we could talk about anything, and um, uh, but I was doing a job that really didn't have any hierarchy attached to it. It was um, it was just easy to do because there was no power play or structure. We didn't have any power, but no one had any power over us either. It was just great. Enjoyed it. Yeah, there's that idea. In the United States, there's this idea of like seeing how the sausage is made. Like you, you grow up, let's just say governmentally, with uh, <laughs> this, this experience of like, oh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the Constitution and America is great. And, you know, the president and the Congress and the Supreme Court and they're all noble humans doing good for freedom. And then you actually go work on Capitol Hill and you see the corruption, you see yeah. the special interest groups and you see the um, just the, the problems and you and you see how the sausage gets made. Well, it's, that's better right. enjoy, it's better just to enjoy the sausage than to actually see <laughs> and the not see the sawdust. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's right. And I think I think that actually brings up the other negative thing about being a bishop or in a stake presidency or in a mission presidency. <clears throat> we we obviously were 
uh, subject to direction from Salt Lake. And so a lot of American leaders would come out. And um, there was this real thing about, you know, we've got to do it the American way. Mm. And um, look, the, I have, you know, hundreds of friends who are American. I've got no problem with uh, Americans per se or, you know, doing things with Americans or whatever. Uh, some of our best friends to this day are faithful American Latter-day Saints. But um, there, was this, there was this added authority that um, not only am I uh, a general authority or whatever it might be, but I'm American. And uh, so therefore you colonials, you, uh, uh, you uh, peons will do it the way I say it because I know I'm American. And that, that, that uh, I think over time that festered a little because, um, uh, I mean, can I put it this way? You know, imagine imagine the church was established in Australia and uh, Australians had to come to America and tell you how to do it because this is the Australian way or to tell you, look, the American constitution is subordinate to the Australian constitution because the Australian constitution is the inspired one yeah. and you've just got this derivative, derivative thing. It wouldn't go over too well. <laughs> um but 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 we're we're expected just to swallow this sort of stuff this uh this uh, manifest destiny that is uh, played out sure in bit parts in other parts of the church outside of america but you know it's its ultimate destiny is to you know rescue the constitution and to welcome jesus to uh to uh uh independence missouri and you know everything is rah rah american and it just um you you won't notice it if you're an american because it, it probably feels natural but if you're outside of that bubble and particularly if you're you're a thinker you've read you've um you've looked at american history you've got different versions of american history than maybe the the foundational myths that are constantly circulated um it doesn't it doesn't go down very well Right. Yeah. And and Neville, before we go on to what happens after they put you out to pasture, so to speak, I, I don't want to get lost. I want to give you a chance to at least speak for a few minutes on what I think for many is the beautiful local community that the Mormon church can provide, even for people in countries like the UK or Australia or elsewise, because you know, I, I, I've traveled through, you know, Mormon churches in Canada and again, the UK. I've been to Guatemala. There's a real, you know, so many people are surrounded in a secular society. They can feel alone. They can feel isolated. They can experience poverty or suffering or loss. And no matter where I've gone, what I've always noticed is kind of the beauty of Mormonism at the local level, because you've got you know, families and parents showing up with kids and they're dressed nicely and their kids are singing songs and their hair is combed and the bows, the girls have the bows in the hair and the, yeah. the couples are working to love each other and the kids have youth groups and they're leaders who care about them and and there's activities and steak dances and and then, you know, my kid marries your kid, you're, you know, my kid marries your kid and there's multi-generational Mormon families. And in a secular, scary world where people feel alone and isolated, you, you believe in a God, you believe in a loving Jesus. You've got a community that cares about you and your life is full of meaning and purpose. And you've got this identity where, okay, there's a bunch of secular people in Australia, but I'm a Mormon and I know who I am and I know God's plan and God loves me and I'm part of something great. Do you mind? I don't. I, I didn't mean to like, uh, like plant that for you to talk about it. But is it that was was that your experience or something like it? And if you just want to start over, what was your Mormon experience overall at the local and even stake level? You know, not counting the leadership for you, for your kids, <clears throat> for your wife, for your friends, all that. Um, <clears throat> it's it's a mixed thing, really, because. Uh, 
we loved the fellowship and we loved the saints and we loved being around them. And yeah, you're right. You know, there are all these people trying to do good things and they're happy and, uh, you know, turning up a sacrament meeting and singing the songs and being involved. If you're, if you're into it, it's great. You know, it really is good. Um, there's nothing quite like it, but, um, then there's the, the qualification on all that. Um, while I was very in it, I was also very on the edge, on the periphery, because I was a little bit odd. You know, our family was a little bit odd. Um, we we live in a in an area where there are uh, some fairly wealthy pockets, but the preponderance of our ward is pretty poor. And of course, as you were saying before, mainly poor people are attracted to the church and they're the sort of people that come along and the um the there was a bit of um resentment i guess you know about my education my being a lawyer our being uh, comparatively wealthy uh driving nice cars that sort of came through for some people not everyone but some people and uh so I was quite often made um, to feel, yeah, sure, you're one of us, but you know, you're not quite one of us because um, you don't have the same struggles that we have. They, they just imagined that our, our life was, um, was carefree. You know, there we were, supposedly the perfect Mormon family, uh, doing all the right Mormon things, an example to everyone. But, you know, we were also the ones that were driving the Volvos and the BMWs and uh, going overseas for holidays and that sort of stuff. And so there was a little bit of resentment too. And, and I always came across as a bit too, um, a bit too uh, toffee or intellectual for their taste. Um, you know, so there was this thing where they'd always come to me for the answers to questions. But when they didn't want an answer to a question, they didn't really want to hear too much from me or or see too much of us because it, it probably reminded them, well, you know, if you maybe made a few different choices in your younger life, that could be your life too. I, I don't know. Because um, there was nothing special about me. I mean, like I said, I came from the wrong side of the tracks. I had to work for every dollar that I've ever had. Um, and I've had to work hard. And... I've put a great deal of time and effort into it, but they don't see that and uh, they don't care about that. And so it was a mixed experience until, I guess, when we were in Brussels. And I'll come to that a little later, but, um, yeah. Um, when what would, what, would, what would Penny and your children say about those years? Something similar or? Yeah, yeah. I think they'd say, I think the kids had good fellowship. They've got a lot of good friends in the church, but they were always treated like, uh, oh, you're the rich kids or you're the uh, snobby kids or you go to the, the toffee schools or whatever it might be. You know, if, if there was any way of winning an argument, they couldn't win any other way. It would always get down to this ad hominem uh approach to things when i say an argument i don't mean there's an actual argument going on but if there's a if there's a some sort of question around well they could always minimize our importance because um you know we weren't really one of them hmm. got it okay yeah the the church does have a lot of teachings about prosperity and uh pride and sort of an anti-intellectual bent and so I can see why. And just the human human nature is sometimes to be envious and, and spiteful of people that are succeeding. So I can see why your family might feel a, a little bit odd or left out in that context. The, the, the irony is that, you know, we, we've had real financial struggles over the years because, you know, I was the sole breadwinner and uh, I ate what I killed and there were lean years and there were good years. Overall, it was good. But uh, there, were, there were tough years. But um, uh, we had exactly the same problems that they would have, and yet we were somehow disqualified from talking about them because um, it just didn't, 
didn't really matter that uh, we would suffer because we had so many compensations. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Well, where should we go next on your Mormon story, Neville? I'm really loving this and enjoying it. So thank you for sharing. Um, um, <clears throat> um, I think chronologically is probably the best thing. We've skipped a whole lot of detail, obviously, because uh, that's fairly it's fairly pedestrian sort of stuff. You know, we had a good time in the church, but we had bad times. So, you know, like that Led Zeppelin song, good times, bad times, we had those, you know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, but overall, but overall, it's, it's been good. And the thing is, it gave me, a kid from the wrong side of the tracks, a way to live where I could actually succeed both at the personal and the family level and uh, professionally. I mean, it gave me all this... Uh, incentive to get on and do things and to work hard and I did all that but okay I think we've got to the point where we had been working as uh, the interfaith uh, directors for the country and um, then I was I, I, I used to make a trek to the states every October um, I would go because there was a J. Reuben Clark Law Society conference because I was in the leadership of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, so I'd go to that conference, and that's that's a society that is designed especially for Latter-day Saint lawyers. Um, it's got about fifteen thousand members across the world, as they would count it. Um, they they count a little bit, I think, like uh, the church counts its members. Um, if you've even just crossed the portal, you're in. But uh, so I I go there for that. Then there was the Law and Religion Symposium, which I went to every year at the BYU Law School. And I, I've probably been to 20 or more of those uh, annually. Um, and, and what are those about? What are, what are these meetings and these councils? About? Okay. The, um, the symposium is one where uh, the International uh, Center for Law and Religion Studies, which is a a unit within the BYU Law School, the J. Room Clark Law School, invites people from all over the world who have an interest in law and religion, and that interest may be peripheral. They may not even, <coughs> excuse me, see themselves as interested in it. But and we're it, talking religious liberty, is that correct? Religious liberty is one big theme that they have, but it's also how religion works in government uh, and interfaces between politics and religion. Anyway, the symposium is held every year and they have usually about 50 delegates um, from countries as diverse as uh, Vietnam and Indonesia, uh, UK, Germany, just South America, uh, Africa. They'll have people from all over. Uh, and uh, they uh, they spend, I guess, about an equal time socialising and in in uh, symposium type settings where there is uh, discussion and presentation of papers and the like. The truth of it is that it's designed to be soft proselytism. That's the real purpose of it. Um, but anyway, I, I'd, I'd been to that every year and um, I was there one, uh, well, it must have been, let me see, just got to get my years right. Uh, it's, it must have been 15, 2015. And Bill Atkin, my friend that I, I uh, spoke to you about before, I was sitting at dinner at one of the social events and he came up and grabbed both my shoulders and he said, how's my favorite silk? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, Bill, how are you? He said, yeah, well. He said, can I talk to you for a minute? And he said, look, Neville, we've got a, we've got a, a vacancy coming up in either Geneva or in Brussels. And we think that you and Penny would just be perfect for it. Um, you'd be representing the church uh, at governmental levels. 
Uh, you'd be working closely with other faith groups that are working on freedom of religion and law and religion issues. And I think you guys would just be great. Um, would you consider that? Well, Penny wasn't with me. And so I had to make this um, fairly interesting phone call. You know how you thought you were going to spend time with grandchildren over the next couple of years? Well, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe you need to rethink. <clears throat> anyway, so she was a little, <clears throat> excuse me again. <clears throat> She was a little reluctant because, oh, I'm sorry, I've got this frog. I've just got to fix this. <clears throat> no worries. Gerardo, I'm, well, Well, one thing, Neville, I, I hope you can hear me. One thing that I, I had the thought of is, you know, you mentioned in interfaith, interfaith efforts on the part of the Mormon church, and you mentioned your participation in the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, and you talk about soft proselytizing. It's hard to ever really... No, but nobody has a single motive. No institution has a single motive. But what occurred to me, Neville, is I don't really imagine church leaders just sitting around saying, I'd love to have a good relationship with other faiths. Let's build bridges. <laughs> because we teach, I think the Mormon church literally has a history from Joseph Smith on of teaching that all other creeds are corrupt and all other churches are false and that what everyone needs to do is stop believing whatever they're believing and join, believe in what the Mormon church teaches and join the Mormon church. But mm -hmm. what happens is, is that when we have enemies, when people see us as a threat, when we denounce the Catholic church, when we, when evangelicals hate us or when governments that are secular, like in Australia, um, want to consider, see us as potentially a cult and want to take away our tax exempt status, then all of a sudden the church leaders uh, care about how other people think and feel about us, even if we're looking on them as inferior. And so whether it's public relations positions or uh, inner interfaith efforts or the like, or diplomatic efforts, it's pretty much always to look after the church's best interests financially, you know, from a fiduciary perspective and from a public relations perspective. My guess is it's not always just genuinely, let's just learn, let's just learn to love other people and, and see what we can learn from them, just like they might be able to learn from us. Now, tell me whether any of that is relevant. And that's me talking while you get a drink mm. of water, basically. Well, just, just going back to when I was in the state presidency, the thing that always came through with these church councils was the first thing we're going to protect is the church. And first and foremost in anything we do uh, in the church is to protect the church. The and that's so... <clears throat> What's that, Rodo? The good name of the church. Yeah, and that's, the name that's, of the that's, church. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true in these uh, public affairs things. That's true in the uh, symposium. Whatever it might be, ultimately it's the church that has come out of this smelling good and looking good and being advantaged. So, yes, you're right. It's, um, <clears throat> there's always an ulterior motive, and it's, it is a clear ulterior motive at all times. Yeah. How, um, and I don't know if this was, if this is, has anything to do with it, but how, how, how much did the church care about the same sex marriage issue around the time you were involved with the G. Rubin Clark Society talking about religious? <clears throat> Is, is was it a topic of conversation um i know uh, that you, you, something that what john was mentioning just reminded me to something greg prince has has said that the church uh mostly mm -hmm. solidified his relationship with other churches specifically the catholic church uh in an effort to fight against same-sex marriage in the united states um and the it, same here <clears throat> Excuse me again. <clears throat> uh, the same same is true here. Um, I probably was one of the leading uh, anti-same-sex advocates in this country for some years. I appeared before just about every parliamentary committee, um, every uh, every committee, every inquiry that there was into same-sex marriage, and it's. Uh, it's equalization with ordinary marriage. 
I advocated strongly against it on constitutional and uh, uh, legal political grounds. And I was successful for a number of years, um, along with a team of other like-minded lawyers. We were able to draft submissions and uh, um, one lawyer and I appeared before the entire uh, upper house, uh, what you'd call the Senate of the Tasmanian Parliament to argue against a bill that had passed their lower house and why it should not be passed by the upper house um, because it would be unconstitutional and would create more problems than it actually uh, would solve. And they accepted our argument. So we kept same-sex marriage at bay for a long time in this country. And, was that uh, something that the church was asking <clears throat> you guys to do? Was it something uh, that... Now, that's, that's the rub, and that's the interesting bit. Um, the church was very encouraging behind the scenes of my doing all this. They loved my doing it. Mm -hmm. um, they thought it was great. But at every, at every committee that I appeared, at every parliamentary inquiry, there'd be an empty chair beside me, either notionally or actually. And that's where that was the chair that the Mormon church was invited to. <clears throat> and it never appeared formally before any of these, these inquiries. And the reason why it didn't, I was told by Jim Amula, <clears throat> is because during Romney's run-up for the presidency, they didn't want anything controversial to be said anywhere in the world against anything at all. Mm. I found that pretty troubling. Why? Well, <clears throat> here, here I was doing the church's dirty work, and they weren't prepared to own up to it. Yeah. It's very similar to what happened mm -hmm. with happens with apologists mm -hmm. today or has happened for several years, right? Like the church wants to keep an arm's length with uh, what Fair Mormon, what this apologist organizations are doing, um, including the conversion therapy organizations like Evergreen or North Star. Uh, they'll <laughs> sit on their boards. They'll... Uh, they'll encourage them. They'll be telling them how happy they are that they're doing this work. But at the same time, they they want to put their feet to the fire and, and say, like, we're we're encouraging this publicly. Um, and that's kind of what was happening to with you. They they were encouraging you to do all this. Like you, you called it dirty work mm. that, the, that the church was expecting you or wanting you to do. But they, they wouldn't show up. Uh, like the official representative of the church wouldn't show up. Well, when, uh, when uh, John, I wonder if we can just pause. I've got to. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. On. Gerardo and I will talk <clears throat> for a second. Um, to, <clears throat> go ahead, um, Neville. Gerardo, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you make a really good point uh, that, you know, th this is lobbying. Like I think about when I worked at Microsoft, Microsoft had a lobbying uh, organization that would go to Capitol Hill and uh, try to persuade senators and congressmen to pass certain legislation or to block certain legislation. It, uh, on the one hand, it feels a little bit insidious that the church would do this. On the other hand, literally every corporation on the planet kind of works this way. If you've got money and power, you use it. And you, you look around and you figure out what the levers of power are, whether it's the media or politicians or federal government, or local government, or the legal system, and you use as much of your money as you feel like you need to, to pull all the right levers of power so that your interests are optimized. Right, Gerardo? Like that's, I mean, on, on one hand, it's weird for a court church to do that. On the other hand, it's literally just, it's, it's the human way. Well, what is weird is like what they're using it for. Like it's one thing for a church to be using its uh, leveraging their power to help people in, in third world countries, to help people who are suffering economically, uh, to, you know, to help people come closer to Christ is another thing to be actively uh, lobbying and fighting against uh, someone right, someone's right to, to marry the person they love, um, which the church today, uh, I'm sure, would be ashamed of admitting how how big of a role they played, not only in the United States, but in other countries, 
uh, to fight against same-sex marriage. You know, there is that uh, quote from Elder Holland, I think it's in Harvard, where he says, "We did, oh, we actually didn't spend a single red cent on Prop 8. Don't, don't try to tie us to that when we all know how, how important of a role the church played on that. So it's one thing to, to have organizations, uh, even churches, lobbying against uh, certain legislations and, 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 and wanting you know, to help uh, a country move forward in, in the best way. But then uh, I think it really shows uh, the interests of the church uh, in, and what, what we're hearing from Neville say. Yeah, and Neville, I want to get you in. I'll just say two things really quickly. I can, I'm to to argue against what I'm what I'm the position I'm taking rhetorically, Gerardo. Yeah. There is the article of faith that says we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. If the church is literally lobbying in sovereign countries to affect their legal system and in your in the in the case you bring up Gerardo to literally take the right and the privilege of marriage away from couples you know that that is problematic and it, it in some sense it goes against that article of faith live and let live uh we really aren't living and let, letting live but the other Gerardo point i think the point you're making Gerardo is the the the, the ways that a church spends its money and power says a lot about that church and yes. to what to what extent was neville being used to like get clean water to people who are are sick to feed the hungry to clothe the naked you know to uh to strengthen families or to promote literacy or education like if the church was using its money and power and lobbying efforts to do that sort of thing that says one set of things about a, a religion that claims or a church that claims to follow Christ, because that's a, supposedly what Christ stood for. But if the church is like primarily using its money and its power and its influence just to preserve its money, to preserve its power, to, to manipulate the legal system so that no changes get made that, that could be inconvenient to the church looking like its leaders aren't called of God or that could challenge the prophetic authority of its leaders. If that's how the church is using its money and its power, then that, I think that calls into question its validity as a, as a religion that, that claims to follow mm -hmm. Christ. Now, Neville, again, <laughs> this was all to give you time to cough. So yeah. what, what, thank you. Thank you. What would you um, like to, to say well, as you jump in? I, I, I recall the day that I picked up Elder Hamula, um, uh, he'd come over from New Zealand to visit Adelaide and I picked him up from the airport and Romney had just lost the election. And I've got a particular mindset about religious people being in uh, positions of power and influence. I don't think that anyone who has made an oath to any organisation that would conflict with their public duty should be elected to public office or should be nominated to public office. Uh, I can develop that if you need to, but that's just a that's just a position that I have. But um, he, I picked him up, and he said, "Well, Neville, we're off the leash now. We're okay. We can start publicly being involved and getting you working for us officially on this same-sex marriage stuff and other issues, because Romney's now lost, and we had radio silence." during the campaign and his lead up to the nomination. So uh, now that that's done, um, we, we can show our face. And I, I mean, I, I wow. didn't show it, but internally I was gobsmacked. I thought, wow, that is really saying what really is going on, that um, we are handmaidens here to American politics and that American politics will dictate what is suitable for Australia when it's convenient to the church. And that was that was really disturbing. Why could we not be seen as being independent and just have the church look after us as an Australian church? And that's where this American church thing comes in at several levels. And uh, at, as we close, I'll tell you, a fairly graphic story about that. But 
Um, anyway, because because Jim was my friend, I didn't make any comment. I just sort of took that in my stride. Um, anyway, uh, I think we were getting up to probably now the Your time. friend was talking to you about maybe going to work in Belgium. Is that right? Or yeah, so Bill Bill puts his hands on my shoulders, and Penny and I have to have to deliberate on this over a distance. And she's she's a little reluctant, but she knows that they want me. Um, and so, as a faithful Latter-day Saint, she's not going to deny them that she knows that they want me for my legal expertise and my experience in public affairs and in hammering together relationships and that sort of thing. So she says yes. And uh, so long story short, we do go and we had probably one of the best times of our life. We just loved every minute of it. Every part of it was just fantastic because we weren't really missionaries in the normal sense. We got a, we got a call from the First Presidency and uh, Elder Wickman wrote a letter as to exactly what our duties would be. And uh, we were a little bit different, though. We weren't under a mission president. We were uh, really autonomous. We worked with uh, the office manager um, uh, in Brussels, but uh, we could uh, just do whatever we needed to do. So we were very quick to form relationships with other uh, NGOs that were, that were faith-based. And in the EU, you have to belong to what's called a platform. And a platform is a group of like-minded uh, NGOs that coalesce to uh, have access to the parliament and European parliamentarians and to work with the commission and to really be part of the, uh, the whole political and constitutional structure of the EU. So we were, we were right in the middle of it all. And what was interesting was a lot of these other NGOs uh, that were very small organisations but had very intelligent, experienced and dedicated people working with them, they quite often didn't have a lawyer in their office. The Catholics had a lawyer or they had several lawyers in their office, but these smaller organisations didn't. And so they were pleased that a lawyer with some experience like I had had come in uh, to our platform and that I could uh, help them with, uh, interpret legislation, that I could draft submissions, that I could uh, uh, take positions, uh, help them take positions that were articulated for members of parliament, that we could go and make submissions to members of parliament. So we, we just had a great time working closely with all these wonderful, excellent, uh, brilliant people. The other thing that was good at a social level for Penny and me was there were three three American couples in our ward who were expat and had been out of the States for several years, uh, except for one missionary couple uh, that were called, the, uh, you probably know, the Norbys. Uh, uh, he was the one that was uh, injured very badly in the, the Brussels airport bombing. Um, but we, we formed fast friendships with these people. And I have to say that if we had a ward in Adelaide um, that had those people in it, we probably wouldn't have had time to ask any of the questions that we did because they would have been around our place working with us and doing stuff and discussing things. Uh, one, of, one of the couples, he the husband was the uh, head of the IMF in Europe, um, the other the other couple had a husband who was uh, the uh, the arms negotiator for NATO. So these were bright, uh, wonderful, faithful, excellent Latter-day Saints. We loved them. We're still friends with them all. We get in contact uh, uh, whenever we can. And uh, we just had a brilliant time with all of them. So we had our work, our work on a day-to-day -day basis was... Um, just to die for. Um, we weren't allowed to wear name tags. In fact, I probably dressed like I am today most days. Um, we weren't supposed to look like or act like missionaries in any way, and we didn't. Um, we just uh, did the work that we had to do. We would, I would write memoranda for Salt Lake to consider on various legislative uh, 
proposals that were going through the uh, the EU Parliament or through the Commission. Uh, okay, Neville, can you give us a, a few examples of the kind of specific uh, legislations or work that the church was? Um, yeah, I, look, I think I think I can give you a generic description that most of the stuff that we're interested in would affect uh, either freedom of religion generally or would affect the way in which the church could operate in Europe. Um, I think that, that everything pretty well fell into those two envelopes. That's that's what we were doing. Um, and there was a lot of stuff. You know, there were a lot of directives that were going through. The other things that we were doing was we were organising uh, monthly conferences. We'd have these breakfast meetings that we'd invite all of the uh, moving parts of the EU to, and we would have specialist speakers uh, speak at these uh, at these things. We'd organise conferences. Uh, uh, my, uh, my daughter, Jackie, came to work with us for a month, and I took her to London with me where we uh, drafted questions for question time, um, and uh, they were used in the House of Commons. We would meet with uh, various religious leaders. So we, we would... Uh, move around Europe, meeting with people that could make a difference to questions we had. Most of our work was in Brussels, but sometimes like we gave talks to the European Human Rights, uh, the Court of Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg. We gave them a talk on comparative religious freedom in Australia and America. We did that. Um, so it was just, it was just go off and have a good time. And that's what we did. Um, we worked hard because we loved it. And, and Neville, I just have to imagine, like, we're starting, and when I kind of started this episode talking about kind of Mormon elite in a particular country, when I talked about kind of Tom Phillips level, even approaching second anointing level Mormonism, I'm just imagining what probably was very thrilling, which is like, well, semi, relatively wealthy, educated, high class Mormon leadership, men and women, couples, wheeling it, you know, picking up general authorities and apostles from the airport, touring around with them while they're in town, presenting in parliaments, interacting with people that, that in their day jobs are among the world's elite, lots of money, lots of power, and high quality people all feeling like they're doing God's work. They're advancing the Lord's one true church, saving the world. Like it just, I, I imagine it was just this amazing, heady, fulfilling, almost like a rush uh, of, of a wonderful experience. Is that fair to say? It, it was Nirvana. It was just fantastic. We, we just didn't have a day when we weren't enthusiastic to get out of bed and get to work because we loved it. Uh, and uh, I guess if you wanted, to, if you wanted to put it into the, uh, comparison of an ordinary mission it's like a like a missionary companionship knocking on every door that just opens they teach all the discussions and the family's baptized every time just every time just <laughs> everywhere you go they just join the church and you, you <laughs> they all love you and you love them and uh, it's just one big happy family so yeah it, it it's it was that sort of thing and uh they were very pleased with the work we did. I mean, we've had reports back um, in the years since where we've been talked about in Frankfurt, uh, uh, Penny and I have been talked about uh, in Frankfurt, and they'll say, yeah, we need a couple like the Roccos to come back here and do this or that, you know. And I, I say that in all humility because we didn't we didn't seek those types of uh, accolades or any praise while we're doing it, but it just worked with us. It fit fitted well with our skill sets because um, Penny's great at organising and great at pulling things together. I, not so much. Um, and uh, But I'm good at the, the intellectual organisation, the putting things into a system and making complex things uh, capable of being broken down into their constituent parts. I can do that. It's just what I do. So... We worked well together as a team. We loved working with uh, Francesco Delillo, who was the office manager. Um, he was brilliant. He'd been doing it for years. He was right on top of this stuff. So we just had an absolutely 
magical time. It was just flawless, faultless. We were working closely with the area presidency um, on most things. We we spoke with uh, with them on a regular basis. We sometimes go up to Frankfurt to meet with them or they'd come down and meet with us or whatever. It was just... And we'd be in constant contact with Salt Lake. Um, when they realised that they could trust us more than perhaps they otherwise might have done, um, instead of things taking six weeks to get approval, they found uh, ways of fast-tracking things we recommended so that it bypassed some of the things that would otherwise be the bureaucratic heaviness of Salt Lake. Um, it, look, I can't. I could talk about this for hours. We loved it. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, it sounds idyllic. It sounds like the type of experience we all aspired to in the church. Let me ask you just really quickly, just as a check-in, when you're engaged in, in these activities at the Belgium, almost like church uh, headquarters level in Europe and elsewhere, what, what was your... What was the literality of your Mormon testimony? Was this God's one and only true church on the earth? Was Gordon, was Russell M. Nelson God's one true prophet on the earth? Was the he book wasn't prophet in... then? He wasn't prophet yet. Oh, okay. And, whoever it was. And, whoever yeah, it was. yeah, but yeah, but the answer to that in short is yes. We we were absolutely committed, uh, signed up, tithe paying, card carrying, uh, yes, sir, no, sir, Mormons. Um uh, but we didn't have too much yes sir, no sir going on. Um, uh, you know, we we could, they trusted us to do the right thing and we did the right thing. Um, we had a lot of license, a lot of, uh, a lot of room, but certainly we did it all with one small exception, and this is very important. Um, we were encouraged at that time to read the essays, um, and the essays were still fairly new, so this is 2014, 2000... 15, 15, 16, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so we were we were encouraged to read them and to be familiar with them because they were out there and the church had put a lot of effort into getting them out. And so people like us should know about them and not be caught flat-footed if anyone asked a question uh, about them. So we Penny and I set out to read them and we read them together. And we were absolutely disappointed we could not believe how bad they were <laughs> uh, we we read them and you know we'd sort of grade them as if we were t uh, marking university papers um we we graded them and you know we'd give one a b and one a c plus <laughs> you know and and just think what are they doing with this this is rubbish um, they were just so poorly constructed and and they were contradictory. They didn't make sense. The grammar was poor in some of them. Um, yeah, we just wondered how some of them got through proofreading. And uh, so we weren't very impressed with those. And I said to Penny, oh, look, at some stage we're going to come back to these. But, you know, okay, we've read them. We're ready for any questions that come up. Wow. And they raised all the questions that we were pretty well armed on anyway. We had um, quite often we'd have interns come and work in our office. And the interns were young single adults who were bright kids. Most of them came from Europe, some of them from the States, but most of them uh, were European, really smart kids, they had good grades and uh, wanted to do something with their testimony and with the church and... Uh, there was one young Dutch girl, and we loved her to bits. She was, she was so down to earth, and she, I, I think, I think she boasted that she'd never worn a skirt in her life. She did not like the idea of wearing a skirt, um, and she was a black belt in Taekwondo. Uh, she was a very disciplined, very intelligent young lady, and all of them spoke impeccable Oxford English. You know, they just they were very smart and very together. I mean, most people in Europe speak several languages, as we know, but uh, these kids were great. So anyway, she had some problems because she, her best friend at school uh, or at university, I can't remember, um, was homosexual, and she couldn't understand the position of the church on homosexuality and same-sex marriage. So we had a couple of books there. I mean, we had a pretty good library in Brussels. I'd 
I'd actually shipped a lot of my library over to Brussels so that we had things available to us. Um, and I think uh, I remember somebody complaining about a 60 kilo bag that we had of books and that they had to lift it. But uh, we had we had a good, pretty good reference library and we gave her a couple of books on some of the questions she was having. And they seemed to satisfy her. They're, they're apologetic books, but they were well researched and well reasoned. So she she was pretty happy with that. And um, so, you know, those there were questions that came up from time to time. And sometimes some of our friends that we had in other churches would courteously ask us questions, but very courteously, and we'd answer those. But for the most part, um, it, it didn't work. We did have one heads up when we first started there. Um, we we're organising a conference working with um, the Alliance Defending Freedom. Now, that sends up uh, uh, balloons in just about every jurisdiction that I know of because of their fanaticism and, uh, you know, their really die-hard die, die hard, uh, ultra-right-wing approach to legal defence. I, I know that. What's but in Brussels... Again? Alliance for what? Alliance Defending Freedom. Okay. ADF is the, the acronym they commonly use. But in Brussels, we got to know the people there and they were, they were wonderful. They were bright. They were intelligent, capable lawyers. The head of the uh, the head of the office was either a master's or a PhD in philosophy. She was really very clever. She was German. Uh, the others were from various parts of Europe, but we got along really well. But the head of the office, we were organizing something and I, I put on the program that we were organizing, um, Brett Schatz, who's at BYU, and Cole Durham both of whom are friends of mine, very clever lawyers and great on law and religion. And she said, um, Neville, I just have to tell you something. We can't have both of them on the program. I said, why not? She said, I'm just going to tell you this for future reference. We like you guys because you're Australian, but Europeans have a real allergy towards Americans and you can never have more than one on a program. I thought, wow. <laughs> and uh, and then another one of them said, you know, we're so glad to have a fresh face on this because we get people in your position that come out and all we hear is that the First Amendment is the gold standard and that we don't know what we're doing and, you know, we've got to think about the American way because it's obviously much better. And so that was, that was a, a bit of a shock to me because I didn't realise that the antipathy to being told how to do things by Americans was so strong in Europe, but it was. And uh, these are from very uh, sophisticated people who are quite open about it. Fun. Very, yeah. very interesting. Right. It, it is very interesting. And I think, I think to some extent it's quite unfair, but I think, I think there is a bit of a, I think there is a bit of an attitude that is carried by uh people who come from Utah cold into a European setting. Um, if you have, like I'd, I'd lived in Europe, Penny had lived in Europe. Uh, we spoke European languages. Uh, Penny's got good French, uh, you know, so we, we sort of fitted in with the European mold uh, in many ways. And, and we loved it. I mean, most of our, most of, most of our vacations have been spent in Europe um, and trying to just blend in. But, uh, I think unconsciously some people just don't blend in as well, and that's the sort of memory that they have when they've had uncomfortable situations. Yeah. You know, it's always – it when you grow up in the United States, of course everyone loves America. Of course this is God's one true country. Of course the Constitution was inspired of God. And, of course, everyone would join an American – the one true American church, because not mm -hmm. only is, is the Mormon church true, America is true. But then you just got to get outside of America. Like I went to Guatemala and someone started telling me about like the United States CIA operations in Latin America, like literally assassinating, you know, presidents of, of sovereign countries and, and destabilizing governments and 
installing dictators and and i'm not an american hater like we get a lot of no, no. listeners and viewers that 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 basically if we just talk about true factual american history some of our american listeners are like well you hate america you know and i'm like no i don't <laughs> hate america but this is factual history and all i'm saying is like it 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 wasn't until i traveled and you know mark twain is famous for saying travel is fatal to prejudice and again i'm yeah. i'm putting an american author here i apologize yeah. but I, it is i love mark twain i love mark twain <laughs> yeah it isn't until you get outside of america that you realize that we don't always have a great reputation everywhere um, no it, i i yeah. think i think uh, uh, americans are the best hosts in the world that you know when you go to america you are made to feel so welcome and you cannot help but have just the best of times because you're great hosts. You, you're very welcoming. And, um, and I would say if you're white. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gerardo. That's, that's, that's the only experience I've had. <laughs> my, my family, I mean, I'm from Mexico and my family, we used to travel to the U.S. just for vacationing a lot. Um, my mom always says that before Obama was president, just coming in and passing through immigration was was was, was not a very pleasant experience. We, uh, as Mexicans, we were made felt like as less. And I mean, things changed after Obama became president um, and how Mexicans traveling to the U.S. started being treated a lot better. But but yeah, that, I, I just want. <laughs> oh, we just lost Gerardo, but uh, but ah. Gerardo, I just want to say, wasn't that wonderful contribution from Gerardo? Because it's so ah, true. It's if you're great. white, if you're white, is the big uh, yeah yeah, dis yeah that's, disclaimer. <laughs> that's that's the takeout. No, and and I I must assume <laughs> that it is true. But we we've never had any problems traveling in America at all. In fact, they love our our cute little accent. You know, I'll say something, anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Neville, uh, let but, me ask you. Oh, go ahead. Was someone going to say something? I wanted to ask Neville. Oh, no, I was just going to say that. Uh, but you're right. Once you venture out of the states, the reputation is not is mixed. It really yeah. is mixed. And and hate or love Republicans or Democrats in the United States, hate or love Donald Trump. I'm just going to say something objective. I think my sense is that George Bush, you know, the second George Bush because of what happened in Iraq and because of our involvement that George Bush wasn't great for the reputation of the United States in foreign no. countries. And then I would say, Repu I, you know, Republican or Democrat aside, Donald Trump's reputation was definitely not good for the United States outside of the United States. Now, Neville, correct me if I'm wrong there. That's my general impression yeah, in fact, awesome in fact, that, that was mentioned to us several times when we were in Europe. Um, you don't, you're not American, so you don't support Donald Trump, do you? Uh, because they were very keen to make sure that we were clear about that, that they, they could not stand Trump in any shape or form. Now, I mean, you know, I've got my own opinions and I won't even express those, but they were very clear about that right from the beginning that Trump, was bad for America's reputation. Yeah, interesting. Really quickly, Neville, I want to ask you from, uh, you know, we all know it happened in 1993 with the September 6th, with the denunciation of Sunstone and Dialogue. It sounds like even though that was upsetting to you, you got swept up into church service and for another several decades, you were doing fine. I just want to, I always ask this question, Around 2004, 2005, the game changer was the internet emerging, Google emerging, and things like Mormon-themed blogs coming on the scene, Mormon-themed internet sites, Mormon-themed podcasts, YouTube, Facebook, social media, and then it really culminating in after the Gospel Topics essays are released, after the Swedish Rescue, um, you know, then we have the excommunications of people like Denver Snuffer and others, and uh, the excommunication of people that are speaking out on social media, whether it's podcasters or Jeremy Runnels or Bill Real or others. You, you, you mentioned the Gospel Topics essays as like a point of pause in 2015, 2016. 
as you were serving not only in, in Australia, but also in the UK, as kind of an elite Mormon influencer, were you aware of the Mormon internet from 2004 to 2016 prior to the Gospel Topics essays? Or were you completely oblivious of all that was going on during that time? Completely oblivious. I really only knew about those things in fairly recent years. I, I mean, I probably was conscious at some level of those things being around. But uh, no, I, I wasn't... I wasn't visiting those sites or thinking about that stuff or knowing anything about it. I was just busy doing the stuff that I had to do. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's all this stuff going on and you're so busy in the church. You're, you're unaware of, of all that stuff, even Sam yeah. Young and all that uh, and everything. Yeah. Oh, Sam, Sam Young sort of came Later. onto my radar a little bit uh, because Sam Young's a little more recent. And okay. so, he, like Kate Kelly, Kate Kelly, and ordained women, and that sort of thing. That I, I was aware of those sorts of things because they were fairly public outside of their uh, internet presence. But uh, um, I and I, I, I've had sort of a, a mild sympathy for their cause, but no time to get to take it up or to really consider it. Yeah, right. Because they keep you so busy. Yeah. Okay. So what's next in your story? I'm dying. Okay. Here. Well, I guess I guess the next thing is coming home. Um, cause that's when things start to move pretty rapidly. Um, uh, Penny, Penny and I came home, uh, and this is, uh, I guess we got home in 16 and for, I guess, eight months, uh, Penny was really absorbed back into primary and doing all the stuff she does with music. Cause she's very... She's very talented as a music teacher. Um, and so she was uh, teaching the primary children music and completely absorbed right into it. And uh, I was just left on the shelf. I what do you do with you, Neville? Neville, I have to ask you that. Like, once you've reached the status of like hobnobbing with Mormon elite in Belgium, you know what I mean? In the UK area presidencies and general authorities. What's it like to come back to your home ward and just, uh, I'll use a, a term, you know, schlepping, schlepping with the local people in your ward serving in primary. That's got to be unstimulating or a letdown on some level, or maybe it's a huge relief and, and really nice to get back to basics. But what was it like for you? Um, not too good. Uh, to me, it was like uh, jumping off a speeding train. Mm. <laughs> you know, you, you land and you dust yourself up and you think, where am I? What's going on? <laughs> so I, you know, we'd been, we'd been traveling at knots. We'd been um, doing really interesting and relevant stuff. We had fantastic friends in the church. Um, and uh, uh, we imagined what a ward would be like if we both, if we all six of us or eight of us could be in the same ward. You know, and then nothing. I was just left on the shelf. The stake president, I think, um, had made it pretty plain. There's a new stake president by this time, but he'd made it pretty plain that uh, he didn't like me much. He, I think he felt a little intimidated by me because he liked to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, and uh, I challenged that proposition for him. Um, so, <laughs> so... He he, just they had nothing for me to do at all, nothing, yeah. um, for months. And then I spoke with a, an area authority friend of mine. Um, I said, you know, "What's going on? I've been I'm just sitting here idle. I'm I'm sure I can get myself busy with the stuff that I'm doing with BYU, um, uh, from a remote sort of thing, which they wanted me to do anyway." Um, but because BYU actually wanted us to go back to BYU after Brussels, they wanted us to go and live in the States. And they saw that as a long-term proposition that we would live there, work in BYU in the law school, and basically go around the world doing the sort of stuff that we'd done in Brussels, only from a base in, in, in Provo. And uh, Penny wasn't having that. She said, no, we can do that remotely and you can travel where you need to, but I just want to be back home. So 
Um, that's the way it was organized. So I had I had stuff to do, but I had no calling at all. And so I spoke to a friend of mine who was an area authority, and I said, you know, Keith, this is ridiculous. Um, I mean, the state president basically trembles whenever he sees me and runs to the other side of the room. Um, what are we going to do? You know, I've got to get some, I've got to get doing something. And he said, leave it with me. And anyway, I got a phone call from the, uh, the mission president. He said, look, I'm down a counsellor. Um, and I feel really good about calling you as a counsellor. How would you feel about that? I said, yeah, that sounds fine. So he, he gave me the usual run through about uh, holding a temple reckon and being worthy and all that sort of thing. And I passed that with flying colours. And next thing I was in the mission presidency. Well, one of the first things we had to do was we had, we had to hold a disciplinary council. And I can't go into the details because they're confidential. Um, but I can describe at a fairly high level that it was a missionary and his um, emotionally and intellectually compromised companion. Uh, and there were some pretty seriously bad things that he did to his companion. And so we uh, we handled that. The missionary was sent home, excommunicated, et cetera, et cetera. Then I spoke to the mission president. I got along really well with the mission president. He and I were good friends almost from the first minute that we met. He was an ophthalmologist uh, from the States, a very bright, smart guy, ideas guy, uh, but never stopped. You know, he's just constantly going. He, he just was constantly moving. And he got me to do a lot of the stuff that he couldn't do as he was moving so fast. Anyway, I said to him one day, I said, look, I'm not comfortable about where we've left this. Sure, we've excommunicated the, the perpetrator. Uh, we've moved him on. But that's all we've done. And that's the very reason why a lot of the Catholic bishops are getting in trouble, because they have done nothing more about getting the thing brought before authorities. And he said, you're right. So I spoke with um, a, a fellow, Silk, uh, who's a friend of mine who specializes in criminal law. And I said, you know, we're sort of bound by confident. Well, we are bound by confidentiality, so we can't make the complaint. Uh, what do you suggest? And he said, work with the victim to, uh, to report to the police what the perpetrator has done. So... I was given the job of working with this young guy who uh, was a lovely young man but had no idea of what had happened to him in terms he knew physically what had happened, but he had no um, no emotional or intellectual response about it. He just didn't compute it. This young guy should not have been on a mission, but he was. And as it turned out, both of the young men came from the same stake. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, they were going to see each other again. Um, so, and, and that was a stake in Australia. So I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just convey that. So I spoke with the mission president and I said, look, we're going to have to help this guy uh, report it. So he, he supported that wholeheartedly. We got Salt Lake involved and I know that Bill Atkin could not have had much to do with what was going on because the work that uh, was coming out of Salt Lake on this whole thing was ham-fisted and amateur. It was just terrible. Um, so I, so I, I sort of, with a friend of mine in New Zealand who is the liaison for church problems like this, we worked out a way that we'd handle it and uh, not get the mission president into any difficulty and... Uh, see if we could get the perp um, put where he needed to be. So I went along to all the police interviews with this young guy. And as he just matter-of-factly told these things that happened to him, things that had not come out in the council, without emoting at all, I found that I was taking on the emotional burden of it all. It was like I was the victim. Mm -hmm. And... I uh, I got into a terrible position where, I mean, I've seen and done a, a lot of hard stuff. You know, I've done a lot of heavy lifting over the years as a legal practitioner. Um, 
you know, there, there isn't anything that can usually shock me very much. But this was different because I wasn't there as a lawyer. I was there as a support person. And in my role as a support person, I was taking on his burden. And I, I, I was ultimately diagnosed with PTSD um, and told to stay away from the church completely because there were too many triggers and that I would end up an emotional and psychological wreck if I didn't disconnect. So I did disconnect. Um, well, so it got away. really severe for you as you were just trying to help people. Yeah. And, well, at one point, John, I was suicidal, and I didn't know why. This was hard stuff. This was hard stuff. So I got some psychological and, this and is medical advice. out of concern for these young men and their well-being. Yeah. And well, you just took it really personal, the well-being of these two young men? Well, particularly, particularly the victim. Okay. Because he – and so ultimately he goes home and the, the stake – I mean, the guy was arrested. The uh, the perp was arrested. He was brought back to Adelaide um, to be arraigned, and uh, it looked like they were going to they were going to try him for what he'd done. <clears throat> but then, then what happened was um, the family and the local ward, which is of a, of a particular ethnic um, persuasion sent the victim to New Zealand so he's out of reach of the police and wow. put a lot of pressure on him not to testify, not to do anything, but just to let it go. And this was the <clears throat> this was his word, like his home word? Yeah. Like yeah. basically the bishop who was, the bishop who was basically saying prison. you should you should just forgive, let it go, don't pursue this. That's right. And that's what happened. <clears throat> I found that very hard. That's familiar because there's a there there's been a a case very similar to that in in Argentina mm -hmm. just recently. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so that was all very hard. So there was no time limit put on how long I would have to be uh, absent from church, but they said it would take years before I could ever walk into a Mormon building again and not be at risk. Um. So I spoke with a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, who's a faithful member of the church and as a psychiatrist. He's one of the leading forensic psycholo psychiatrists here. And I talked with him about it and he said, well, yeah, you've got to, you've got to follow that advice. I, I can understand that. So, yeah, do it. Um, and he also gave me some warnings that, you know, staying away from the church for a long time, you'll, there is a risk that you will stray. And I said, yeah, I know, that's, that is a risk. Um, and I'm, I'm alive to it. But um, anyway, then, uh, then a few months after that, um, Penny was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer, with um, uh, uterine cancer, and diagnosed in that she had to have surgery the next week. It was, it was aggressive and it was about to breach the uterine wall. They had to give her a hysterectomy, and then that would be followed up with chemotherapy and radiotherapy and the like. So she was immunocompromised for several months, and so that gave us another reason not to go <clears throat> to church, that is. So I said to her one day, I said, look, Penny, we're stuck here on a Sunday doing nothing when we'd normally be worshipping. Why don't we dust off all of those questions that you and I have had over the years because I had I had a little file in my in my uh, both in my computer and also in my head about questions about the Book of Mormon. I was planning on writing a book in response to all the questions that had been raised about the Book of Mormon, not knowing what the data might be or not knowing what the evidence was, but being confident that I'd be able to, as a lawyer, prove the Book of Mormon to be true on the evidence. And uh, I said, why don't we dust all that stuff off and? <clears throat> just pursue those questions to their limit. She said, sure, let's do it. Can so just, we can I, Neville, can I just say this does mm -hmm. remind me of Tom Phillips. I, I started mentioning Tom. It wasn't until Tom Phillips was out of serving in the in the stake presidencies 
out of serving the area presidency. And same with Hans Matson. It's not until he was kind of released as an area authority before he like said, whoa, for the first time, I actually have time to study these things. It's it's almost like if the church can keep you on this treadmill of being busy, serving, serving, you know, being a dad, you know, being a mom, being a provider, you're never yeah. going to have time to actually stop and think and process. And it was, well, they say idleness <clears throat> is the devil's workshop. It's like you didn't have a, a big calling. You, you, you weren't being fully utilized. And that's got to be dangerous for the church a little bit. <laughs> well, the other, the other thing was that um, I'd been encouraged by a long-term friend of mine at the university to do a PhD. <clears throat> <clears throat> and, at, and at this time, I'd, I'd start, excuse me again. <clears throat> at this time, I'd started the PhD. Oh, look, John, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to take another break. No Sorry. problem, no problem. So, Gerardo, you were saying that you related a little bit when, when we were talking about <laughs> devil coming home, uh, you, you were saying that reminded you of, of, a, of a friend or a family member. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, um, a really close family member who literally gets depressed and, and anxiety and sometimes anxiety attacks when he, when he doesn't have high-level callings. So it's been in state presidencies, uh, mission presidencies, and at, at one point, wouldn't have like a, a calling for for a period of time and it was getting yeah stressed and depressed it's, it's kind of like an interesting but um, it's not like pride it's not like i've got to be important yeah I've, i'm i'm better than everybody i sense it's more you just you want to make a difference and, right. and be used at your full capacity is that right right right, right. yeah yeah it's 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 pretty interesting how the church uh, makes people feel that way. That they they always have to be, you know, so involved because they could be involved in you know other humanitarian causes, or but but it's it's we're in the church and high high level callings with they feel like that's that's the God that's the God God's way. Yeah, yeah, and and. On the one hand, what I hear you saying, Gerardo, is maybe there there are so many other better uses of high quality people and their time and their money and their power. So on the one hand, as we're looking back now, maybe having the church not totally worked for us, there's a degree to which we could all say, man, I wish Neville could have been used in other ways other than to take same-sex marriage away from Europeans or whatever, Australians. Yeah. On the other hand, when you don't have meaning and purpose in your life, and even let's just say, especially when you're older, but probably at any point, uh, it's probably better that you have some meaning or, or purpose than to have none. Yeah. And so Neville, in that sense, we're just talking about you, um, you know, feeling frustrated that you weren't being fully utilized once you got back to Australia and, and then having leisure time to study the church. It's a real, it's a real conundrum because my guess is it was really healthy for you and Hans Matson and Tom Phillips and their spouses to all be hyper utilized. But then, but then it, once that disappears, it kind of leaves you uh, rudderless a little bit. Yeah, I think that's right. But the, but as I was, as I was about to say, I I'd, I'd started a PhD uh, around this time, and. Uh, or I, well, I was contemplating starting it, uh, whichever it, whichever way it goes. I can't remember exactly the sequence, but uh, um, one of my supervisors was going to be a good friend of mine, Paul Babby. Paul is an ordained uh, Orthodox Catholic priest, Ukrainian Orthodox Catholic priest, so that means that he's married um, and uh, has children. But he and I have been friends for many, many years, and I've I've brought him to the symposium. Of he's been to Salt Lake, he's been to the Mormon History Museum with me, he's uh, met general authorities with me. He's done, he's done it all. Um, in terms of exposure to the interesting stuff in Mormonism, and we've had some very good discussions. He loves uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. You know, he's just a He's just a really good man. And uh, we've been able to be frank about our faith journeys over the years. 
And I, I remember a meeting very early in his supervision of my PhD where I said to him, you know, I'm even more committed now to following where the evidence leads me than I've ever been before and I've, because I've never extended that to my religion before now. But as I do it, I find that the evidence is not stacking up the way that I thought it would. And I just don't, I don't, I don't know what to do about that. And that's when he told me a Buddhist parable that has been of use to him and various other people that he knows well, where a man is making his way down the road of life and having all the experiences that life throws up. And he comes to a stream and the stream um, can't be crossed other than by a boat. And he espies a boat by the side of the road. He thinks, okay, I'll cross the, I'll cross the stream using this boat. So he gets across to the other side of the stream and the road of life is there for him to continue on. And he has to, he has the question, well, the Buddha asked the question, but he has the question, you know, what do I, what do I do with this boat? Do I carry it just in case there's another stream or do I leave it? And of course, the, the metaphor is pretty obvious. The church helped me cross a lot of streams um, when I was younger, when I needed to cross uh, the stream of having a dysfunctional family background and uh, coming from the wrong side of the tracks and having to get an education. But what was it doing for me now that I had meaning and purpose in my life and that I'd pretty well worked out where I stood on a lot of things? And uh, that, was, that was almost like a release valve for me. It was almost like giving me permission to really go where the evidence took me. And that, that was part of what informed the inquiry that Penny and I got engaged in when we started looking at, uh, at things. We looked at the essays. We looked at, well, Dan Vogel uh, was very helpful to me on the Book of Abraham. After I'd, after I'd looked at the stuff that Dan said, I thought, it's obvious the Book of Abraham is not what it claims to be. It just isn't. Yeah. And that, although I'd heard that around the traps quite a bit, I thought that's one of the things I'll get to eventually. And when I got to it, it really disturbed me that it wasn't what it claimed to be and it couldn't be what it claimed to be. And this, this fiction of uh, translation being some uh, other means of receiving revelation than what translation actually means was as incredible as the hat in the rock to me. It was just stupid. And I wasn't going to have my intelligence insulted by that. Um, and besides, even, even if it were revelation, it was internally uh, unsupportable as a matter of historical fact. And it still had the racism entrenched that I thought was just despicable on the part of the church. So... Uh, the Book of Abraham just crumbled. Um, and I thought, well, if that's so, then um, what about the Book of Mormon? Is there any way that I can hold on to the Book of Mormon? So I read, read Grant Palmer's book, um, An Insider's View on, on Mormonism. And I thought, well, whether he's right or he's wrong, it doesn't look too healthy for the Mormon uh, church or the Book of Mormon at all. And so it's like a, like a set of dominoes, you know, when you set them on edge and you've got them all lined up, the dominoes just started falling one by one. And Penny was a little reluctant, I think. I don't think she minds my telling, telling you this. She was a little reluctant about it all. She was saying, but I can't believe Joseph Smith was a rogue. I just, I just can't believe that. Well, when she started to learn about the way that the church finances were being held, truly uh, being run, she said, this is just an, uh, an American money-making corporation. It's really a pyramid scheme. I don't want any part of it. And then all the other stuff made sense to her and it all fit together. And that was the end of it for us. 
that was it. Now, then, then my daughter, uh, Jackie, with whom I've got a very good relationship, I'm very close to her. She and I have travelled the world together. I mean, we've done... Um, I, I, we 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 had two months where we travelled uh, in New York, Paris, and London, and we just had each other together. And we didn't have a crossword during that time. We just loved being together, and we had a fantastic time. She's a Jane Austen freak, and I took her to Jane Austen's house, and you know, we just had this fantastic time. Well, since since when she was young, she's now become a lawyer, and she's very sharp. Um, and she's also a philosophy graduate, so she's good on philosophy and things like that. She said, Dad, I'm not too sure about the way you're going with the church. Have you been reading anti-Mormon literature? And I said, I actually haven't. I've, it's basically the stuff we read in the essays and a few other things that just don't make sense. I haven't read the CES letter or anything like that. Just It just isn't gelling for me. And she said, well, look, why don't you do this? Why don't you just... Stick to the New Testament. Just read the Bible daily and let that be your spiritual sustenance. And in the meantime, um, Ben, her husband, and I, we'll look at the essays and see what we think. In six weeks' time, they asked the bishop to remove their names. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This was, your, this was your daughter? Youngest daughter, my youngest daughter. Yeah. And what year, what year was this, Neville? Um, they've been out... About three years. So it's about okay. three years ago. Yeah, it's about, about, the, about the time that I started my PhD. Yeah. So three years ago, your daughter and her family left the church. <laughs> now, he, her, her husband's family are strict, true believing Mormons. Um, it's caused a big rift there, but uh, Ben just can't see how he believed it all the time that he has. He's he's a psychologist, and you know he's he's no uh, intellectual slouch. Jackie's no intellectual slouch. What killed it for them with the essays was when you read the footnotes. Yeah, it the the prose peels away to nothing, and uh, she she reads footnotes. You know she's she's a good researcher. I I use her whenever I can as a proofreader because she's the best person I know on the earth. In terms of footnotes, she can do footnotes quicker than anyone I know, but she reads footnotes <laughs> and it didn't fit. So they were out. My other daughter was out. My son is still in, but, um, well, I, I don't want to speak for him, but, uh, uh, you know, he's he's got his own journey that uh, I think is moving in a certain direction. But isn't it, Neville, isn't it kind of interesting, and I'm being a little bit repetitive here, that... The Book of Abraham stuff was discovered in like 1967, 1968. The Tanners were writing about it in the late 60s. That's right. It was, it was covered ad nauseum in dialogue, yeah. like yeah. Robert Rittner's publishing articles in dialogue about the Book of Abraham. You're That's subscribing true. to dialogue. And yep. somehow <laughs> it wasn't until like a few years ago in 20, 2017, 2018, that you actually have the time to read about that for the first time and process it, what, 30 or 40 years after the information was made available. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, I mean, that's just where the opportunity to reflect on things and also the opportunity to say, okay, now I am going to find the answers. Now I am going to be uh, looking at the evidence and seeing where it goes with the utmost of uh, goodwill and good faith, thinking that that would resolve in favour of the church, really believing that, um, and then finding that it ain't necessarily so. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, yeah, uh, after that, um, so I, I, I continued with my PhD. I had a uh, fellowship that I had to, well, didn't have to, but I was offered... Uh, in Mannheim, Germany, so I went there for a couple of uh, for a couple of months. While I was there, I started to feel ill, had to come home. It turned out that I had multiple myeloma, Diagnosis. so I was, yeah. I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and 
you know, by this time I have no time whatsoever for any religion at all. And I was determined that no Mormons would turn up with casseroles or make inquiries or whatever. Now, they were pretty darn determined. They, they hung in there and they tried every which way they could to come and visit us and to be with us. I, I, I was stuck in Perth, which is the other side of the country, for a month because I couldn't travel home. I, I got back from Germany, but I was three hours from dying when I arrived in Perth. So they had to keep me in hospital there, and uh, uh, they did for a month. And Penny came over, and we spent that time, and we did a lot of talking about things. But during that time, people were constantly pestering, wanting to be involved. I just wanted to live. I just wanted to get better. And so I just uh, refused any uh, communication whatsoever with Mormons during that time. And since then, they pretty well left us alone. Um, I had a... Uh, I had a, 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 a transplant, uh, a marrow transplant at the end of that year. Since then, I've been uh, pretty, pretty well recovering and doing a lot better. But um, um, apart from those few friends that I choose to communicate with in the church, I don't have any communication with the church at all now, <clears throat> apart from one little incident that occurred last year, which was very interesting. <clears throat> and I call it um, the Adelaide Cricket Ground story <laughs> because um, what happened was one of the area authorities with whom we worked very closely when we were the, um, the interfaith directors um, years before, he, out of the blue, sent me an email saying, um, look, I'm going to be in Adelaide um, in a couple of weeks. Can I take you and Penny out to lunch? And uh, I read it out to Penny and smiled, and I said, what do you think this is about? <clears throat> and she said, what's his, what's his calling at the moment? I said, I don't know, but I, I'm sure there's some sort of rub in all this, but let's go, go along out of curiosity. So we did, and we had a nice lunch at one of the Indian restaurants that's just around the corner here, um, and uh, conversation was pretty high level and um, just reminiscing on a few things. Then he sent for the for the bill. Um, it was his treat. He was going to pay, and he said, um, "Neville, tomorrow there's a special meeting at the Adelaide Cricket Ground for the um, International Centre for Law and Religious Studies." And I thought this is odd because I'm actually I, I was actually a senior fellow at the centre. Um, and it's the sort of thing that I would not only be involved in, but I'd certainly know about. And I didn't know a thing. <clears throat> so um, I, I looked at Penny and I said, shall we go along just for curiosity to see what this is all about? And she said, uh, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we went and he was there to meet us and uh, took us up to the, uh, to the members' room. I mean, I know the Adelaide Cricket Ground pretty well. But this is, this is a room that has an absolutely spectacular view of the ground and uh, the northern part of the city, the cathedral. It's completely picturesque and it was a beautiful venue. So we sat down. But what do we find when, we're, when we walk in? The place is teeming with Mormons who would have no idea about law and religion and have no connection whatsoever with the International Centre for Law and Religious Studies. Um, these people would have no clue about anything connected with uh, uh, religious freedom, uh, constitutional permissibility of legislative restriction. They wouldn't know any of it. And the mission president was there, and the missionaries are wearing their name tags, all the things that are completely forbidden in this sort of setting, they're all happening. And uh, so we sat down and uh, we found ourselves a nice little corner. And a friend of mine who's uh, a professor at one of the other universities uh, sat with us. Uh, he's, he's actually Community of Christ, as it turns out. But he, anyway, he sat with us. And then my, one of my supervisors was there. And so she came and sat with us as well. And... Uh, Susan Lemire, Suzanne Lemire, who's my other supervisor other than Paul, um, 
she is one of the nicest people you'll ever find anywhere on the planet. She just is uh, grace epitomized. And uh, she's also one of the sharpest people. She's the president of the, the Corporate Lawyers Association of Australia. She's got a razor sharp mind, very clever, but a wonderful supervisor and a wonderful person. Anyway, the, the thing gets underway and the, the, uh, an area authority, the, the head area authority for Australia comes up and kneels down beside me and says, oh, Neville, it's good to see you here. I wish we could have had you involved in this because you would have got all the right people here and we've struggled to get the right people. So we've invited all these other members along to just uh, fill up the seats. But uh, I was wondering, would you speak today? And I said, yeah, okay, I'll speak. <laughs> and so I did, and I explained how dignity works as a constitutional principle to bring about uh, religious freedom, how they interconnect, um, and how I was a signatory to an inter international document um, that supported dignity as uh, something that should be promoted worldwide in connection with the uh, anniversary of the Universal, De Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, explained how the ICLRS worked, how the symposium worked, what they could expect if they ever went, went to one. Then I sat down. Well, from there, it just was, a, it was a complete debacle because no one knew what was going on and no one who's presenting it had any clue what they were doing. They had a video going on over the other side of the room that had President Nelson at one point in it and then some excerpts from a previous symposium. Uh, no one could hear it, no one could see it, and it's just nonsense and a waste of everybody's time. And I could see Suzanne, who has complete equanimity, just getting more and more angry and couldn't wait to get out of there. Anyway, she said to me afterwards, she said, Neville, I went to that because I thought you were connected with it somehow and I thought out of courtesy I'd go. That's one of the worst things I've been to. I never want to have anything to do with the Mormons ever again. And I said, well, as it turns out, Suzanne, neither do I, and I had nothing to do with it. And she said, good, you know, um, and she apparently tore strips over some, off some church leader about it she knew, and that's just not her at all. But um, then so what followed... So what, what was the, what was the thing that she didn't like about, about? It's a waste of time. It was a complete waste of time. They didn't do anything on what they said they were going to be doing. Hmm. It was just it was a she was brought there under false pretenses, and she's a busy lady. She's also very, and um, she'd been conned, and she was angry about being conned, and she had been conned. Anyway. Um, that's one side of it. What happened after that was I started getting these text messages and emails. Oh, Neville, good to see you. Um, you know, we really need your expertise. We need really need your your involvement again. Um, and then I had the area authority call me up and said, look, Neville, we'll have you back on any terms. You write your own ticket. You know, whatever you want to do, you can do. Just come back. And what do you think? <laughs> what do you what do you think that was about, Neville? What were they doing there? Oh, they're trying to get me back into the church, obviously, but they need me. What were they afraid this stuff. of? Were they afraid of something, do you think? Oh, I don't think they were afraid of anything, but I just think they knew that they didn't have the grunt or the intellectual firepower to carry off what they were trying to do uh, in law and religion in Australia. They just don't have anybody that can do it. Well, I mean, there are some people that can do it. That's not fair. There are some very smart people that can, but, but they knew that I'd been very successful and I had the Brussels experience and... Right. They just knew that it worked well with me. And uh, and I kept on saying, look, no, I'm, I'm not interested in coming back. I'm not interested in being involved. Anyway, in the end, they got me to talk to the local director who was going to get me involved in the next project. And he, I called him and he said, oh, Neville, I'm glad you called. We're going to get to work straight away. And I said, no, I'm calling you to tell you I'm not going to work with you. Oh, why is that? I said, well, look, there are two basic reasons. First of all, the church has just released a policy statement about HR5, which is a piece of legislation that passed the House of Representatives on civil and political rights. 
with which I agree. I think it catches America up 40 years by being at by it being passed. It is where you should be to catch up with the rest of the world. I said I support it, but the church has come out and said that it doesn't. Now, I can't be involved with any organisation where people know that the position I'd be adopting in that organisation is contrary to what I've published. I'm not going to be involved. And I said the second reason is this. You do not have the intellectual firepower to carry the weight that you're taking on. You've got no one who can actually talk to these issues in any convincing or compelling way. And he said, yeah, that's going to be you. And I said, no, it's not. For the reasons that I've just explained, I'm not going to carry the burden of this um, because that's that's what would end up happening. I'd have to do it. So anyway, that closed it down. And since then, they haven't bothered me. Um, but that was about the closest I came to having my name officially removed from the records. I thought if they give me any more trouble over this, I will just... I will just remove my name. But I haven't bothered to do that, and I probably won't bother to do that. But um, it's all with, under the umbrella of my relationship with the church having changed. I don't attend. I don't believe. But I don't, um, I don't make any trouble either. I don't uh, go out of my way to tell people the things that I believe or know because that's a private matter and I don't want to uh, – I, d- I don't see it my – role or position to disturb anyone else's faith but leave me alone is my Mm -hmm. mantra now what was that like emotionally and psychologically you talked about getting depressed um with uh with watching the church protect uh, a sexual predator what was it like losing your faith in a church you know you you started talking about how your life wasn't great then you joined the church and it gave you meaning and purpose and community. It provided all these these benefits and values to your life that you kind of uh, experienced a lot of adversity and made a lot of sacrifices to become a member, putting a lot of intellectual things on the shelf. Fast forward decades, and all of a sudden you come to this conclusion that it isn't true and that it wasn't what you thought and that it's, as you said, a, a bag of beans. Is that is that a term you used earlier? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What was that like for you emotionally and psychologically? Were you like exhilarated? Were you thrilled? Were you depressed and sad? Were you relieved? What was that like psychologically to just say, I'm done? John, it's been a journey. Um, I think initially I was pretty angry that I'd been lied to as I saw it. Yeah. Um, And particularly with me where I'd raised specifically the uh, rock and the hat issue as a game, as a deal breaker. And they said, no, that's not true. And now it is true, all of a sudden. Um, So at first I was a bit angry. But, you know, I've I've reached, I think, part of the process, because I've been in good hands while I've been doing my PhD with good people working with me, and the stuff that I've been reading and the stuff that Penny and I have been studying together, I've reached a point of equanimity where I'm completely at peace. I have... No ill feelings whatsoever, no anger, no distress. Um, I'm just, I'm, I've never been happier in my life. I'm really very happy. I'm calm. I'm at ease with who I am, where I stand on things. Uh, I, I, I really, uh, there's a book that I read by Michael Sandel, um, you know, doing about doing the right thing. And that's how I see myself, you know, a person trying in all situations to do the right thing for the right reason, not for any accolades, certainly not for any report, um, certainly not to fulfil any statistical criterion, but because it's just in my core to do the right thing for the right reason, for the right motive. So that's where I am. I just, I want to live a good life and I want to be kind to others. My PhD thesis uh, has as one of its main themes human dignity and studying dignity deeply human dignity deeply had a profound influence on the way that I see other people and the way I see the world and I think that everyone is entitled to be treated with dignity and for that reason my view on same-sex marriage and 
homosexuality has changed dramatically. Um, I have nothing like the views that I had when I was an active member of the church. Um, I'm embarrassed by the views that I expressed and advoc advocated for. I, um, I have... I have no, I'm no respecter of persons, if that's a term that we're allowed to use about humans. Um, I, uh, and one of my, I go walking with a barrister friend of mine who's a colleague, um, and we, we go for a walk for five, six Ks every morning, and then we ha treat ourselves to breakfast. And he said, you know, Neville, I've known you for a while, but you've changed in recent times. You seem prepared to talk to anyone about anything and treat them so kindly. That wasn't you years ago. And I said, well, you know, first of all, now that I'm no longer uh, an active member of the church, I don't have the motivation of trying to convert people. So therefore, I feel like I can be honest in my relationships. Secondly, I think that everyone should be treated with dignity and they should be treated kindly. And if I can make their day better by a kindly word or act, I'd rather do that than do nothing. And so I enjoy it. And he, he liked that. He thought that was a fair explanation. But that that was interesting for him to observe that contrast in the way that I, I approach things and do things. I remember people's names. I call them by their name. I, I just love people, but I love them from something that's in my core and not from some teaching. And if you had to just restate why you, you talk about doing the right thing for the right reasons, if you had to state why it was the right thing for you to do to no longer attend the Mormon church, uh, what, why was that the right thing to do? What were your because, reasons? Because as a matter of integrity, I can't profess by outward actions, namely attendance or any sort of involvement, I can't profess by those actions, something to be true that I know, thoroughgoingly know, is a falsehood and is based upon um, a sham, a fraud, and lies. I cannot do it. Even if there's good coming out of it, there are other ways in which I can achieve good than going through that sham. Yeah. 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 And, and it was hard. It's taken you some years, but but now you're saying you're happier than you've ever been? Yeah. I can honestly say that. Um, I've got an equanimity that I just can't remember having possessed before. I don't have any guilt about either doing or not doing things. Um, and I'm not doing anything that um, would really get me in trouble with the Mormon church anyway. Uh, I mean, you, you know, I, I live a pretty good life. I mean, we live a very quiet life, so the the chance to um, get involved in egregious sin is pretty limited for me. But um, I, I, I just um, I, I don't feel guilty that I'm not doing enough, that I'm not living up to the standards, that I'm not, you know, striving for perfection. I see perfection as a ridiculous objective for this life and to be perfect in anything is silly because that's to refuse our, our humanity our in fact i think it is a denial of our human dignity because we tend to judge others by the the extent to which they are prepared to strive for perfection as well and whether we say it or whether we're conscious of it or not we are judging people by a standard that is inculcated into us that we ought not to use for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not everyone arrives at that conclusion, but that's the conclusion you've arrived at. And I think it's so it's one many of our listeners and viewers are going to respect. Um, yeah. yeah. I have to, I have to ask, what's it like to receive a cancer diagnosis where you're starting like there's a okay, there's a lot of Mormons that don't reach the conclusion you do. They're like, man, I've invested 40, 50, 60 years in this. Why would I leave it now? Oh, I don't want to disrupt my kids or my grandkids. There's this term that's developed recently, PIMO, P-I-M-O, um, physically in, mentally out. And it represents all these Mormons that, yeah, just like you, they're like, of course I don't really believe it's true, Neville. 
Of course, the Book of Mormon isn't historical. Of course, the Book of Abraham is not a translation. Of course, Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet. But like, it's my tribe. It's my people. This is my heritage. I don't want to disrupt my kids, my grandkids. Maybe it'll. Maybe my kids and grandkids will ostracize or marginalize me. Maybe it could affect my business. And so I'm going to stay in because there are more benefits to staying in and more costs for leaving. I I better just stay. Yeah, uh, that's that's a very good thing to raise, and I've got a couple of answers to it. Um, the first answer I think is this: that the default position for a Mormon for a Mormon in Australia is to be secular. It's odd to be in the church, and so to no longer believe it. It's the default position would be to go out of it. Whereas if you're in, you know, the Wasatch Front and the church is no longer true in your mind, the default position is not leaving because the sociality is so, uh, it's so shot through with Mormonism that the default position is just to stay in that social milieu. So, um I think that's a cultural difference that uh, comes about by being a member of the church outside of the stronghold of Mormonism, uh, compared uh, compared with Australia, where it's never it's not a stronghold anywhere. Um, so that's the first answer. The second answer is this, um, uh, and I think you were implying this about the the cancer diagnosis. I remember it very clearly because. Um, I was in a hospital bed in, in the Royal Perth Hospital and the specialist came in and said, look, we've got a diagnosis and um, not only have your kidneys failed, but they've, they've failed because you've got multiple myeloma and um, there is no cure, but there are ways in which we can treat. And as soon as, as, soon as he said that, um, Penny started to cry. And I said, don't cry. It's going to be okay. It, it's uh, just a thing through which we have to pass. It's just um, one more thing that you and I have to do, and we've done lots of things in the past. We can do this. So she she sobered up and straightened her back and said, yep, okay, let's do that. And so as much pain and suffering as I've been through over the last few years, I've never felt for one day to complain because it's just another thing. It's just something I've got to pass through. It's um, it's great to be alive. I'm happy to be alive on any terms. But that's not a faith position. That's not um, God has sent this to me, so therefore I've got to endure it. It's just a life position. And if anything, I probably go more to Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics um, to for adopting that sort of uh, stance where we just live life one day at a time, living in the moment, accepting things that come to us without complaint. And I'm very comfortable with that. The um, the other philosopher that helps me a lot, I think, is uh, Immanuel Kant, just where, you know, that, that he's defined a way in which we can see others in their right frame with that dignity that I was talking about before. But I've found a lot of comfort a lot of consolation in philosophy, not as a new religion or a substitution for it, but just giving me insights that are available and that others have adopted previously. So I don't need any divine intervention or any uh, blessings or prayers or anything. All we need is right here in us. And I found that inner strength when I was getting out of uh, out of Munheim, when I found out that I was really ill and couldn't go on, I had no physical strength whatsoever. But there was some something in me that just gave me enough to get myself packed up, get on the plane to London, and then from London to Perth to get through. And um, and that's just how I see life. I just say it's just another thing. We just have to pass through it, however bad it seems. Um, it it will either pass or it won't. If it won't pass, well, then we just have to accept that as being the new default position. 
how have you come out in terms of a belief in God and Jesus, if you want to share that? And then how have you come out in terms of a belief in the afterlife? Okay. Um, can I treat those separately? Because yeah, please. For me, they, for me, they are quite distinct. Um, I think, I think the true position where I am regarding God is I just don't know. And so, in that sense, I'm a true agnostic. I think probably I lean towards there being some sort of organizing principle, some sort of um, some sort of something that would explain where the Big Bang came from. But of course, then there are the anterior questions: where did that come from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Got all that, understand it. That's why I don't take it as a, a dogmatic position. I just don't know, but I'm open to all possibilities. Um, do I think there's a big man in the sky that looks like one of the cut-out cardboard uh, deities that Mormons worship? No, I don't think that's the answer. Um, as far as Jesus goes, I, I believe in a historical Jesus, but I don't think I can really subscribe to the resurrection. I don't think I can believe in an atonement. I don't believe that we actually need an atonement. I think we come into this world um, innocent but imperfect. We live this life the best we can, and then we go out of it. Um, but I don't think we need to be uh, genuflecting before, before some superior authority that claims they've got some sort of revelation from God that puts them in charge of us. I can't accept that at all. That's just... No, that, that's not where I am anymore. But um, now, in terms of an afterlife, I think I think there are so many things we can't explain that we can't preclude it. Whether it's a, a Greek shades type of afterlife where we're in the Elysian fields or whether it's, um, you know, uh, a Roman afterlife where we've got to go across the river Styx to, uh, to Hades, whether it's uh, a, uh, a nor north, northern European type of afterlife where we hope to go to Valhalla. I just, I just don't know. But this, this I can say that we've had, both Penny and I have had some experiences where there's enough evidence for us to doubt when somebody says there is no afterlife because no one's come back and told us whether there is or isn't. And anyone who says that they have is either deluded or lying. But um, we have had experiences, and one is where Penny had a, a very close relationship with a young man uh, when she was a young adult, and he was he he formed a special bond with her. I won't go into the details of it. But he was a he was a Latter Day Saint who became inactive, followed a certain lifestyle that uh, the church would definitely frown upon, and uh, one day Penny heard him call out, where he just said Penny, and she looked around. She thought he was in the room. She was in the kitchen and he wasn't there, and she looked around and he wasn't there. The next day his mother called and said that at that time he'd passed away. In Sydney, you know, several thousand kilometres from here, or eighteen hundred kilometres from here. So, on that evidence and <clears throat> various other, excuse me, <clears throat> pieces of evidence, um, we can't preclude the idea of a, an afterlife. But believing what it is or knowing what it is, I'm not so arrogant as to say that. I just don't know. Okay, makes sense. Um, Neville, I'm, I'm reading through your outline and there are several things that you put up there that, that you may have wanted to touch on. You can decline to touch on any of these, or you can just say briefly, uh, but I'm going to just go through and read some of the ones I think we may have not touched on and just give you a chance to kind of weigh in. Is that okay? Sure. Sure. Yeah. All right, so you talked about the essays. You're not a fan of the essays. Talked about the book of Abraham. You did. I don't. I don't believe you talked about the first vision accounts. Is that right? Yeah. I. I mean, that's that's more of the same. I, I. As a lawyer, I can't see how anyone can have 
God the Father and the Son appear to them, that would be a life-changing experience and not to have that clearly emblazoned upon your memory so that you can remember and relate every detail whenever you're called upon to do so. I mean, I've cross-examined a number of people over the years and I've cross-examined enough to know that uh, if you can't get your story straight, then probably your story isn't straight at all. Okay, so you're referring to Joseph Smith changing his first vision accounts with time. Uh, look, I've, I've heard the, the historical apologist saying, oh, the fact that there are different accounts actually solidifies the veracity of it all. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. There, there isn't one forensically trained person in the world that could genuinely believe that is so. It's usually an indication of a liar. And judges usually rely upon exactly that to find against somebody's credibility. That's that's just complete fiction when they come up with this sort of new um, uh, forensic theory that only historians are privy to. Oh, I just can't believe it. And I don't believe that historians genuinely subscribe to it either. Okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, it just reminds me to uh, when John was interviewing Dan mm -hmm. Vogel and he was relating... Uh, I think John asked him about Emma Smith lying uh, about polygamy. And doesn't that mean that like, did Emma could have lied about anything else? And something that Vogel said, well, that's not how historians see this. Uh, that's how a lawyer would see it. Like, if you lie <laughs> about one thing, you lie about everything else. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. That you as a, like, having a lawyer mind, how you... You, you can see through the, the first vision different accounts. Well, well, look, look. Just just to follow up on that, um, look. If he had two accounts that were slightly different, right? Sure, but the the details of these several accounts differ so fundamentally that it all looks like invention. And I think even Dan would say that um, uh, no historian that is genuine in their craft would think that's okay. Right. Yeah. So you 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 have a bullet that says Joseph Smith as a scoundrel. Is there anything you want to say about what you mean by that? Oh, well, I, I think that both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were utter scoundrels, and uh, the whole polygamy story, the the uh, propositioning of young women on the basis of their salvation depending upon it, and you know an angel appearing with the sword. Why didn't he just let the, the, the angel slay him then? Big deal. Who cares? It's it's all such such. Um, it's a way of manipulating a believing mind to get what you want, and it's that's that's scurrilous. I think that's just terrible. Yeah. So not a big fan of Joseph and Brigham. Oh, <laughs> uh, you you have a bullet that says. Uh, um, well, well, you say young is a scoundrel on a frolic. What? <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is, once once he was once he didn't have to worry about anyone tarring and feathering him. Once he was in Utah territory or desert territory, and he was governor and prophet and had absolute power. I mean, the things that he got up to, and I, we don't need to go through those, but you know, he just. He went off on a frolic. He probably did the things that Joseph Smith would dream of, um, but never was able to because he was in the United States and had uh, a lot of uh, local pressure stopping him, uh, principal among those being the law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so not a big fan of Brigham Young. Uh, what about you have... Russell and Nelson as a walking <laughs> embarrassment. So oh, that's, the current, that's the current Mormon church prophet, for those who don't know. And well, you've got him described as a walking embarrassment. What do you mean by that? Well, he is embarrassing. I mean, <laughs> he's just terrible. But well, why think, so? For those who well, don't know who he is, why, well, why so? Let, let, me, let me start with, uh, and this is when we're still, you know, card-carrying members of the church. We were watching his being called as the, the new president, and um, he holds his press conference. That press conference is utterly embarrassing. I mean, it's, 
It's folksy, it's scripted, um, and it's clear that um, there's been a change of the guard in um, the church public affairs because there's no way that the previous guard under which we worked would have let anything so folksy and stupid as that ever pass as an international press conference. Even Dallin Oaks mouthing yeah. the things that uh, Nelson was supposed to say because they'd learned it all off by heart. It was just ridiculous. And then, then you know, his, his um, having the notebook by his bedside and waiting for the inspiration. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's the inspiration he gets? Oh, I know, I know, it's, I know. God, you want me to talk about gratitude just about the time we're about to have Thanksgiving in America. Great. Yeah, we'll do that, God. <laughs> it's just so silly. It's just silly. I could go on, but he, no one takes him seriously outside of the church. He just, he can't be regarded with any seriousness. He's not seen as a great world leader in Australia, as a great religious Saves I don't think anyone him. knows who he is. And <laughs> those that do couldn't care less about him. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think we any of us really want to be mean. but it, oh, I'm, I don't want to be mean either, yeah. but but and I really don't. I mean, having said all the things that I said about dignity, but when somebody sets themselves up as being having this special conduit to God where they've got a direct telephone line and the bat phone rings every night and, you know, he's got to jot it all down, what is the one thing that he's done to help with COVID, to help with world hunger, to help with world disease? And he's sitting on a pot of several billion dollars where he could do just about anything he likes. What are they doing? And just looking at it objectively now in ways that I wouldn't have done years ago, I, I, I just think there's so much good that he could do that in his um, his floundering way he just doesn't get around to yeah sorry and I don't, I, i'm sorry that's going to offend some people i know that and I, I i really didn't want to quite go to that extent but uh, no, it's just embarrassing well i'll just say not to pile on but when you think about how much money hundreds of billions of dollars just in assets in investments yeah. it's a trillion dollar church with so much power with you know, with U.S. senators and U.S. congressmen and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies all over the world, with all of the church's wealth and money and power, with all the power that, that Russell M. Nelson has as president, just take any major world problem, hunger, starvation, you know. Take your pick. Take your pick. Uh, sanitation, disease, natural disasters, sex trafficking, like pick your pick your poison. Russell M. Nelson and or the Mormon Church could just make huge inroads, and it just seems like all they care about is meddling in in governmental affairs to make sure people like Gerardo can't marry people like Gerardo's husband Zach, and that's literally all the church is going to use its money and power for, outside of maintaining its money and power. <laughs> there's also uh, there, there's a, a a a good argument to be made about some some of the stuff that Neville is saying. Jo uh, it, it, it's it really looks like, to me at least, that Russell M. Nelson has this uh, somewhat of a god complex, where mm -hmm. he he wants to be the savior of the of the church, the savior of the name of Jesus. Um, even if you just look at at his talks and just analyze them uh one of the ones that comes to my mind is when the november 15 policy the gay exclusion policy oh. uh, was reversed oh, uh, he yes. went to to byu and gave this talk if you read it and anyone that analyzes that that objectively you can tell that he what he's saying is that he was the one that pleaded to god uh, and change, got him to change his mind. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But God put this policy in place, and and He was the one that had to go and plead to God to to help these LGBT people and their children who were suffering, and to change his mind about the policy. Gerardo, like, that 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 has been the source of so much private mirth for me. Hey, hey, God, 
to you. You know, I think you need to get this right. You probably made a mistake with us back then. And, you know, really help us get this right. Would you just think about it again? I mean, I know you're all knowing, all powerful, all loving, but I just the creator think this, of all, the creator uh, of all things. You know, you, you're such a cool guy. I know you don't want this to go down in history that you are so cruel. So, look, I'm happy to take the hit. You know, I'll announce that you've changed your mind. God's like, <laughs> good idea, Russell. Oh, good idea, thanks, Russ. That, I didn't even. I couldn't see into the future. You know, I had my I had my crystal ball or my Urim and thumb, and it's it's on the blink. <laughs> oh. Yeah, 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 but it's just, it's kind of infuriating, you know, like what he, uh, when when that, when that talk came, came, came out, my husband was kind of coming out to his family as a non-believing, but believer, and um, one of the, his mom came to him and asked him, like, did you, did you listen to Russell M. Nelson's talk at BYU? Do you think he's lying? Um, you know about <laughs> about <laughs> and my I don't my 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 husband's response was like I don't think he thinks he's lying, uh, <laughs> but it's just it's just this it was ridiculous how he was blaming God for this policy and and and, and that and that and this is not the only one he's done this several times and then exactly you count yeah. you know. Radio Free Mormon and others have have uh, talked about how Russell M. Nelson has has lied several times about his his uh, spiritual experiences. Wendy Nelson, uh, his wife, has lied, and and we know about 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 um, experiences that they've been they've told in his biography that had to be reversed. Like it's just that that just brought him up as like someone that's so close to God. And so in touch with him, and like you're saying, Neville, that like he talks to him every night, and and he w- wakes him up so he can write in his notebook um, what God is telling him that wants him to do with his church. Um, yeah, just really interesting. Sorry. We're a really interesting uh, prophet we have right now. Yeah, yeah it was fun. All right, do you want to do you want to uh, say anything about the churches and his finances, or have you said everything you want to say? I, I don't like to go there because, look, uh, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a tax lawyer. It it looks sufficiently suspicious to warrant some inquiry. But see, we don't we don't have that sort of problem here in Australia because we have a charities commission that requires a return to be filed every year from every charity that uh, gets a tax deduction. It's a, it's an open book, and um, and inquiries can be demanded and the like. But um, I think things work pretty differently to the advantage of churches in America where they don't have to be open. They don't have to be honest with people about the financing. And the church has got more and more reclusive and more and more secretive about the way that it runs its finances. I'm too ambitious since, a lot of my songs. Sorry about that. Yeah. It, it's got more and more secretive and, uh, and uh, cloak and dagger about all this ever since, I guess, in Eldon Tanner took over. But uh, certainly in recent years where there's just no financial report of any kind at all, and yet we're expected to deposit huge sums of money into this pot of money that they hold very close to themselves with no idea where it goes. It's just trust me. And uh, I don't see a lot of reason to trust anybody, really. Sure. Uh, You mentioned... um a double standard on use and abuse of prominent members. Did you did you say everything you want to say about that? I, I, know I, that I you- think I, I think I think we've covered that in the you know, obviously I, I've been prominent at some level from the church's perspective, but you know, they can give you a hard time privately, but when they need you publicly, they'll they'll sing your praises and and wheel you out and say, Now go off and impress these people. Uh it's it's there's a there's a schizoid approach to things there. I mean, yeah, like I would hope that if they were okay using your power and influence and money and reputation to advance the causes of the church in an ideal world, if you had questions or concerns about the church, 
they would be equally as interested and concerned about you as they were when they needed you, that it would be reciprocal. And uh, I, I know that that's naive and idealistic to hope that. But my guess is they drop you and, and forget about you as soon as they have no use for you. Is that extreme? There's, there's, no, there's no good PR in me anymore. Uh, I've, I can do nothing to help their PR. And in fact, that was quite clear um, from BYU. When I, when, I, when I resigned as a senior fellow at the, um, at the centre because I said I, I can't have a public position with the uh, with the center when its sponsor church is taking a position that I fundamentally disagree with well the uh, I haven't heard anything since then from the director of the center I've heard from other good friends in the center who have been just wonderful but but you know it just yeah it dropped like a hot potato yeah and, and I don't care just that's the way it is I, I mean you know I'm I'm not um, insecure or um, depending upon anyone's approval for anything. I don't have to prove anything to anyone. But um, it was just an interesting thing. Yeah. Anything you want to say about Mormon missions uh, and their mm -hmm. value to the world or their, you know? I, I hope, I hope that one day they stop sending missionaries out to proselytize. I think that's just wrong. And if they sent them out to serve and to do good and to help people, um, I think that would be a much better use of this tremendous human resource that they have. Now, at one stage it was 80,000 missionaries. I think now it's dropped back to 50 or 60. I'm not sure. I haven't checked the numbers. But 50 or 60 young, able-bodied people going out to do good things that benefit communities rather than advance a church that is after money um, would be really a very positive outcome for the world. Um, and I, I would hope that at some stage that that sense is is seen and acted upon. But I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fiercely opposed to proselytization. I don't agree with it. I don't think you should be doing it. And certainly not without making full disclosure as to exactly what they're getting into. So um, rather than just the sanitized discussions that tell you enough to uh, think this is a good thing, just saying, well, look, you know, we've got a history and it's not pretty if you look at it and we have to be open and honest with you about that. And by the way, you'll be on your very thin slither of knowledge about the church, you'll be committed to paying tithing for the rest of your life, but we're not going to tell you how that's spent. Um, and you'll just have to take that on faith. You know, you can't, you can't just have one side of the ledger being presented. As a check-in, how is the, and I've got some more questions, but just as a check-in, how is the church doing in Australia? What's your sense for activity rates? Is the church growing leaps and bounds? Is it stagnated? Is it shrinking and they're closing missions and branches and wards and shutting down buildings? What's the health of the Mormon church in Australia in 2022? Well, I, I'm, I'm relying upon hearsay for that because I, I don't have access to those uh, those data anymore. But um, my good friend Simon Southerton has done a lot of work in this area. And I've also got some friends in England uh, who, whom I think you've had on your show that uh, have shared some things with me that indicate that um, it's really shrinking fairly rapidly. They are worried about people like me and other prominent members leaving. And um, I think there is a lot of shutting down or rationalisation that's going on. Quite what the details of that are, I don't know, but I don't think it's growing in any way that is uh, relative to the population. I think it's going backwards in relation to the population. I also think that COVID has given a lot of people a furlough from church where they've taken the opportunity to look at a lot of things like like I've done and like others have done and um, probably ain't coming back no more. Um, I, I was told by some friends at the ward of which I was bishop, which used to have an attendance of about 130 to 150, which is considered good, um, is now down to about 30 or 40. 
um, each week. Um, I, I don't know. That's like I said, that's hearsay, and I I wouldn't uh, attest to it. But um, my impression is that it's going backwards pretty rapidly. Yeah, that um, I mean that's true all over only utah seems to be growing in some ways and not in salt lake county but in utah county and that's because so many people are abandoning outside of the united outside of utah they're abandoning their places of residence and moving to zion Mm -hmm. so that they can have their kids raised around other mormons but yeah yeah it seems like that's just not mormonism it seems like religions in decline in in the developed world in Europe, in Asia, in Canada, Latin America, like religions on the ropes and Mormonism is no exception. Yeah. Um, talk, talk briefly, Neville, you, you've talked a little bit about American exceptionalism and manifest destiny and, and kind of like the problems of being living outside of the United States, but being part of a, of a U S church that seems to view the U S church as, the United States is the best of all countries. You know, you 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 hmm. list some bullets here about never really feeling like those general authorities that are largely from Utah and Idaho, <clears throat> never really feeling like they really cared much to learn about Australia, to learn from the Australian members, to uh, to really draw wisdom from from your from your people. Do you want to talk anything about? Yeah, can I, I'll, I'll just touch on that briefly if I can, because I, 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 again, I don't want to come across as being in any way anti-American, but the, the, the truth of it is simply this, that it's very hard if you're an informed intellectual Mormon who knows something about constitutions, about political systems, um, and about so, uh, social systems, if you know anything about that and you keep abreast of public affairs, it's very hard to swallow this thing of, um, you know, America is the best and, you you know, you guys are all just uh, um, uh, second-rate citizens, which comes across quite a bit. Um, Sometimes it manifests itself in fairly ugly and embarrassing ways. I mean, one example might be, I mean, one has to bear this in mind, that a lot of Australian universities are in the top 100 or 200 in the world the the university quality uh, the quality of university education here is extremely high um if you if you go here and you do well at university then you can walk in for your postgraduate work to harvard oxford to stanford because they're well recognized schools um so you know it it it's we've got a good educational system and reputation you know, I remember sitting in a meeting where these two um, ne'er-do-well academics from BYU, Idaho, came out here and were trying to convince people to get involved in what they call the Pathways Program, which would give them pathways into higher education for paying a small fee uh, to this church-sponsored thing. And they're, they're using up church time to sell this. Well, they didn't, they didn't question for a moment that there were some university teachers sitting in the congregation listening to this palaver. They didn't recognise that um, BYU-Idaho ranks about eight or 900 among the universities in the world. And they didn't realise that free of charge, you can do the same thing in Australia by getting entry pathways that are going to cost you at the very most 50 bucks a year to... Uh, to get back into those pathways that are already well established by the government. You don't need the church for it, but instead they're taking their, what I think are exorbitant fees to get Australians involved in this thing because they're faithful Mormons and don't know any better. That's just one example. Uh, If they'd done their homework, they wouldn't have got on the plane. They're wasting everyone's time and money. Um, uh, You know, there have been a number of other examples, but... um, you know, they're, they're balanced out by my good experiences, I have to say, but sometimes it's just a little bit hard. But the, I think the hardest thing for me recently was when Dallin Oaks waxed lyrical about the inspired constitution in general conference. 
I know there are a few versions of that talk, and it seems to have been edited to uh, take out some of his mistakes that he made the first time round. Um, but I can tell you, not one of his reasons stacks up to anyone who's well-versed constitutionally, and particularly somebody like me who's done a bit of comparative constitutional law. In fact, every one of those things, if I could sit down with him, and I, I know Dallin Oaks, I mean, I, I hope I could still talk to him, but if I could sit down with him and say, well, out of your five reasons, not one of them stacks up, either historically or logically, and certainly not legally. So, you know, there was this... And that, that was the talk that he gave at a general conference, right? Yeah, that's right. The last talk of the last session. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> the short of it is this, that anyone who's well-versed would know that that was wrong. But also, they would have great difficulty accepting what he was trying to say, which is there's not just uh, an inspired constitution for Americans, it's, a con it's an inspired constitution for the entire church and everyone in the church needs to get behind this concept that it is inspired. It's not. It can't be. I mean, I'm not going to bore your, your audience with um, a number of the constitutional quirks and problems that the American constitution has. It's a great document. It was groundbreaking. And it is built on a number of previously uh, well-regarded and groundbreaking documents, but it has its ambitions, it has its failings, and um, no one in their right mind, other than somebody who's a dogmatist or an apologist, could say that it's inspired. Right. It's just part of the historical unfolding. A great, great historical unfolding, great respect for it. Don't get me wrong. And our constitution borrowed some of the best of that, then borrowed the best of the English constitutional system. And I think we've come up with a very good hybrid that, dare I say, is superior to the American constitutional system. Am I allowed to say that without, you know, being tarred and feathered? Um, and that's the problem, you know. I mean, knowing stuff gets in the way of being a good Mormon quite often. <laughs> that's a good quote. Gerardo, yeah. write that down. Knowing stuff gets in the way of being a good Mormon. That should be quote of the year. Write that down. <laughs> I'll write it down. That's really good, Neville. What do you mean, Neville, by selling coal? Forgive me if you've already answered this, but you've got selling coals to Newcastle. Oh, that was the Idaho and, example. That was and its pathways. Yeah. 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 That was that. I mean, anyone, anybody who had done their homework would not send to also ran fairly uh, lackluster academics out here to try and sell their wares. They wouldn't bother. It's a waste of money and time. Trying to sell BYU pathways to Australians who have a really good education system. Yeah. yeah is folly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, do you, you know, as someone who worked hard with your reputation and intellect to prevent same sex marriage, maybe not just in Australia, but in other countries, do you have anything to say now that you're kind of in a different position, both ah. about your efforts previously and about the church's ongoing efforts to prevent same-sex marriage or to punish people who have been same-sex married? Look, I, I, I'm, I'm deeply ashamed of the way in which I applied my craft to achieve what I did in that regard. I, if, if there's anything about which I carry a guilt, it is that I was wrong. I was wrong to do that. And I was wrong in the way that I was able to persuade others to agree with me. Um, I wish I had never, ever done that. I wish I could have seen things more clearly much earlier. But being the, the faithful member that I was and being in the position I was, there was no opportunity for me to step back and say, well, is this okay? Um, it's not okay. It wasn't okay. And it never can be okay. And I would hope that one day the Mormon church can see that and can say, well, look, maybe um, in terms of our orthodoxy and our doctrine, we can't do much about temple marriage for same-sex couples. 
But certainly, if a couple is same-sex married according to the laws of the state, country, we can accept them as full card-carrying members for all other purposes than um, temple ordinances related to marriage. Um, I, I just don't see why, I don't see how they'd lose any skin in that game. Um, and so uh, that's something that I've concluded more recently, of course, but um, now I see it, I just see it with that clarion um, lucidity that I just didn't have before. So that's that's what I'd like to say about same sex marriage. Well, what, I just what's wrong? What's wrong with opposing same sex marriage? Just say it. What's right with same sex marriage, or what's wrong with opposing it? If you don't mind, just stating it for the it, record. It is it it is an in, it's an insult to a person's human dignity, not to permit them to live their life as they see fit and to love and have a relationship with a person as their as their conscience and their heart dictates. I just don't see it. Now, whether you want to call it a sinful relationship or not is, to me, um, an Old Testament artifact. And I just can't do that anymore. I can't... I, I see, the Old Testament has got so many problems for me because there's not only the genocide, but there are the murders of people for small infractions of ridiculous laws like Sabbath breaking or wearing uh, uh, the wrong combination of clothing or whatever. So the Old Testament, to me, is not a good basis upon which to draw upon for any sort of moral code in relation to same-sex marriage or homosexuality. So if you're without that, and if you're only left with some vague allusions to it in the writings of Paul, um, that's a pretty weak basis to go into bat so heavily, as the church does, to make sure it doesn't become part of it. And the reality is that marriage in its nature has changed several times over the millennia. Sure, the preponderance of time, one might say that it's been monogamous, uh, monogamous heterosexual relationships. Yep, okay. But it hasn't always been that. And if you look at Greek and Roman culture, um, there was no embargo, even with pedophilia, really. Now, that's something that probably crosses my moral line, but um, uh, but they certainly didn't have the aversion to homosexual relationships that our society seems to have. And yet, for millennia, we've been having homosexual relationships in the dark, as it were, in the shadows, and we've, we've got to start being honest about what our moral... Uh, our mores are mora in morality and in sociality. I love it. Gerardo, mm -hmm. what'd you think? You like that? Oh, Gerardo's muted. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I like that. All right. That's well, thanks cool. for spelling that out for us, Neville. Neville, you've got a section on cultural smuggling where you mentioned Halloween and dress and grooming standards. Yeah, that's, that, I think that speaks for itself, you know, okay. even before even before commercialization of Halloween started to become a, a thing here, it was almost like, you know, the, the church every October would be turned by the missionaries into this horror house, this scary place for kids to go, which was just, just culturally inapt for Australians. We've never had Halloween until the last 10 years, I would say. But the church has been trying to sneak it in for a long time. When I say the church, I mean, obviously, it's missionaries and American leaders and the like, because they just can't see anything wrong with it. Personally, I can't see anything right with it. I think it's a stupid holiday. But, <laughs> but I know that's going to offend a lot of people. <laughs> but I just think it's ridiculous that a religious person would think it's okay to dress up as a devil or, or a demon or a witch or whatever to celebrate a holiday that doesn't really signify anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the, you know, the United States dress and grooming standards, it seems like the church, the Mormon church is realizing that the IBM way of dressing with white shirts and ties is not, is not going to, is not the future. Not only. Well, it's not. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, when I go to other people's churches, I don't see a tie anywhere because it's not the way Australians dress to go to church. It's not the way. I mean, people, um, you know, women will wear slacks, um, they'll wear sundresses, they'll wear uh, things without sleeves, the men will wear 
um, casual attire. They'll, they'll, they'll be reasonably dressed, but they won't be, they won't be executive style. And some people can't afford that anyway. And it's hardly a way to include people to say, now the first thing you can do is buy a jacket and a tie, a jacket and a tie so you can pass the sacrament. But I can't even afford to put bread on the table. Well, you know, you pay your tithing, it'll work out. <laughs> it's uh, it's just all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Neville, let me ask you, um, you, you write in here open condemnation and mockery of the Australian way of life. That's when, happened. When, when do lot. Australians feel mocked, and in what ways <clears throat> do Australians, oh, well, well, Australian Mormons feel mocked? The biggest, the biggest offenders uh, of that are American mission presidents. You know, um, when I was in the stake presidency, when I've been a bishop, I mean, they've behaved absolutely abominably in saying, "Well, you just don't know how to do it here. You've got no idea. You're not Americans. You, you know, they, they're quite express about it." And they've made fun of our way of doing things and just, um, you know, um, they exploit the cultural differences to their own benefit and to use it as a, a source of derision of us. And it, it has happened. It happens less and less now. But um, it's mainly been American mission presence, not so much general authorities, I guess, um, and missionaries, you know, missionaries complain about the culture, the food, um, the way that we speak, the way we do things. Um, shut up. We've given you a visa. Be happy. Just look at Djokovic. <laughs> <laughs> the tennis player? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll take it away from you. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you talked a little bit about when you left and wanting to be left alone. Uh, I just wanted to give you a last, uh, by, by the church, left alone by the church, you have as kind of a last bullet, pathetically ham-fisted reclaim efforts. That that was really the uh, ICLRS thing at the cricket ground. That that was okay. That was ridiculous. But I've also had these things where I've had text messages, but I'm your friend. Why won't you, why won't you let me come around and visit you and look after you? Uh, you know, I think I could add something to your family. Well, you know, where have you been the last 20 years? <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> and, and frankly, I don't think I do want to. Um, you're a nice person and all that, but let's just leave it there. Are you, you know, I, I, I often ask people this, like given the amount of time and money and reputation and effort that you spent serving in all the callings, bishop and stake presidencies, mission presidencies, uh, you know, in Belgium, all that stuff. Given the um, giving all the sacrifices and commitments you've made to the church, was it how, how what has been people's um, interest? What has been Mormons' interest in finding out what happened, in finding out why you left? And in trying to maintain a relationship with you as a human, as someone who served them and helped them for so long, to what extent have people, Mormons, made an effort who you knew and who you cared about and who you loved? To what extent have they made an effort to, number one, figure out why you left, and number two, uh, to, to, ma to maintain a relationship with you? Um, look, I'm not going to be critical of anyone because I've been pretty... I've been pretty solid in refusing them access. So even if they had good motives uh, or whatever they wanted to say, I've never done it. I've had a couple come around and, um, you know, uh, unannounced. I had one high council come around unannounced and try to bury his testimony to me. And I said, look, stop right there. I'm not interested in your testimony. I've heard it a million times. Um, keep it to yourself. I, I'm not coming back. I don't want to go through the reasons. Just leave me alone. So the, the leave me alone mantra um, has had left people, I guess, puzzled. But um, uh, I haven't given them the chance to do the good. The friends that I've had, the friends that I, that I was close to before I uh, distanced myself, I'm still friends with them. And I still talk with them and I've given them where it's appropriate reasons and 
they accept me as I am. And uh, so they've been good and I have no problems with that. But uh, as far as uh, just members that I, I was associated with but not particularly friendly, I've given them no chance to do those good things that they might want to do to inquire. So in fairness to them, I just think the fact that there's been zero, zero effort is probably my fault rather than theirs. Okay. So you're not one that says, I can't believe I gave all these decades of service and that why aren't they asking me? Why are why did I lose all my friends? You're just happy to be left alone and to I'm live. Very out. happy. Yeah, okay. That makes this sense. where I am suits me completely. I'm like I said to you, I'm perfectly happy, perfectly adjusted. I love being with Penny all the time. You know, we spend a lot of time having a lot of fun. I don't need anybody else. And if I, I mean, I, I have, I have regular uh, luncheon dates and outings with friends. Um, I'm very socially connected, but just for an hour or two every time, uh, so that I don't take up too much of their time, and so that I can get on with things that I'm interested in as well. So I'm not socially deprived. Um, and where there's a, a member that I trust, I'm still friends with them. And they're still friends with me, um, but. You know, I, I've just, um, I do what I think is uh, psychically appropriate for me, uh, what I need. And I, I don't want to waste any time because I, who knows how much time I've got. I mean, I'll never get rid of this disease. It's controlled. And I might have a year. I might have 10 years. I might have 20 years. I, I, no one knows. They can't tell. But I'm trying to spend every moment with the best quality that I possibly can, with the best people that I can possibly associate with and or be kind to people that maybe I can help out with to make them a better person if that's what they want to do. Love it. Um, really quickly, just a couple more questions, Gerardo, and I want you to be able to ask any more questions. I know you've been really generous with your time. I have a dear friend named Dr. Dave Christian that served a mission Um in uh in australia the australia sydney mission from 1979 to 1981 and it was there that his mission president uh orson wright uh called several of his sister missionaries to be polygamous oh, wives. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's right and i'm wondering if you if you learned about that you you would have joined the church by then and i'm wondering if that would have been kept from you or if you would have I, heard about that at the time it was happening, or if you would have learned about it since. I've, I've learned about it in recent years. I knew nothing about it. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that fun that they, that the, well, I mean, it's horrible that that happened. Isn't it interesting that it was kept from the members forever? Yeah, I, I knew. In fact, I was on my mission in Germany at that time, so I was probably out of any loop that might have been uh, open to me. Yeah. Okay, and then also... Do you, do, do you have any, you know, we, we all share in common the, the friend Simon Southerton, who, for those who don't know, uh, because they're joining us for the first time or are new, Simon Southerton was a, a geneticist and a Mormon bishop in Australia. Back in the, I'm going to say, oh, let's just say late 90s, early 2000s, when he starts studying Native American DNA and discovers that Book of Mormon, uh, that the, the Native Americans were not descendants of Israeli origin like the Book of Mormon teaches, but instead came from Asia. And this caused Simon Southerton, an Australian, to lose his faith and then to go on to write a book called Losing a Lost Tribe, which was highly influential in my faith journey while I was living in Seattle working for Microsoft back in the early 2000s. I'm just curious whether you knew anything about Simon Southerton or this happening as a fellow Australian while that was happening. Uh, and, and if there's anything you want to say about Simon Southerton now. Well, well, Simon Southerton is a, a good friend. Um, but that's only since uh, recent times, very recent times. When I was in the church, and particularly when I was in leadership, there was um, a lot of press within the church about Simon Southerton and how he was a liar. He was an adulterer. He was a cheat. He was um, uh, he couldn't be trusted. That his DNA stuff didn't stack up. Um, a, a huge propaganda campaign wow. had been set up to absolutely denigrate him 
in the minds of anybody that might have wanted to talk with him. So I didn't know him from Adam, um, and I, I didn't make any contact at that time, and neither did I have reason to. But he certainly, there were certainly, in the same with, with Fawn Brody's book, there were absolute barriers erected in terms of any, um, any communication with him. And um, maybe there will be some barriers erected around me now. I don't know. Don't talk to Neville Rocco. But, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't know Simon then. I've since read his work. I, I find his scholarship great. Um, and we've talked about and collaborated on a lot of small projects here and there. Um, but I, I, I think he and I differ in one way in that um, I'm, I'm okay where I am now. You know, I, I don't need to um, pick any more stuff up and take the church to pieces. I think I could, but I just don't. I don't, I've, I don't know how long I've got. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to waste energy on things that bring me no joy. Well, shout out to Simon. We love you, Simon. Um, yeah, we do love you, Simon. And uh, and Neville, I do want to say I, I would love to read that book of your analysis of the Book of Mormon. I, there, <laughs> it's I, not going to be written. <laughs> obviously, I do wish that you would finish that book. It's never going to be. It's never going to see the light of day. <laughs> but I mean, if you're literally saying one to ten years left of life, is that really how you want to spend your last one to ten exactly. years? Right? <clears throat> that's that's exactly my problem. That um, I, I mean, look, I think I think I've actually got decades to go. Um, all the all, right. all the indicators are that I'm fine, you know. But that could change at any moment, and I'm ready for that. I don't care uh, if um, if today is my last day on earth. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, I'm I have no fear of death. I have no concern about it. I'm not worried about um, the big uh, father figure um, holding me over the co coals or throwing me onto the coals. Um, at the end of it, I don't believe in a hell. I'm not sure I believe in a heaven, but I certainly don't want to be in heaven with the sort of God that is a monster that we see uh, in the scriptures and, uh, and in Mormon teaching and the like. And if there is no afterlife, and if this is it, and then when you die, that's it, what do you have to say about that? doesn't bother me. That's fine. Mm. I love it. Gerardo, do you have any final questions for Neville? <clears throat> no. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I love everything he said. Um, I agree with a lot of stuff he said. I can relate in, 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 a, in a lot of levels as to like an outsider um, being and being raised a Mormon uh, outside of the United States. Um, and it, this has been a great interview. Thank you, Neville, for your time. You were, you well, were super generous. I want to thank you both. And, and I really love the work you're doing. Um, I mean, just, just the same as Simon, you, John, get a lot of undeserved bad press within the church. I think you're making a, a very positive contribution that benefits us all. And I hope you continue to do the great work you're doing and i'm just grateful i'm just very grateful for what you do and who you are and your integrity and the way you stand uh for for good things for you for very good things i i just salute you and uh pay you my respect wow neville that means a lot that means a lot coming from you and i want to come maybe i'll come visit you one of these days it'd be fun to meet you and i hope you do course. and yeah. you're welcome anytime and uh We've got we've got some rooms upstairs you can stay in if you want to. And what part again? What part of Australia are you in? I'm in Adelaide. Adelaide, and where is that? It's in the it's on the coast in the centre. So, um, uh, right right smack between Perth and Sydney, East that coast? distant East Coast, no, it's Southern Coast. It's southern. right between Sydney and Melbourne. So Sydney's on the east coast, Perth's on the west. We're right in the centre on the coast, um, and. Uh, Voted the second most livable city in the world. Are the beaches nice? The beaches are impeccable. They're fantastic. Gerardo, it sounds like we need a thrive, a thrive <laughs> Adelaide. What do you think? Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> well, you know, we're 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 15 minutes from the beach. We're 15 minutes from the hills. We're it's just a beautiful city to live in. We love it. 
We have a very important question from Richard Jones. He's saying, can anyone ask Neville what his favorite beer is? And that's assuming you drink beer. I, I, I actually don't like beer. I've, I tried it after I came out of the church and I didn't like it. And, I, and so pretty well, I don't drink alcohol at all now. I, I experimented with it, with it for about six months, just taking tastes, never really drinking it. And it just didn't gel with me. It just didn't work. So I don't, I don't drink anything other than, other than just uh, soft drinks and sparkling water. I love it. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm not very exciting. <laughs> no, well, I've never tried beer or alcohol of any kind. Either. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, oh, okay. One last question. Neville, I, you're a modest, you're a humble guy, especially for how uh, experienced and knowledgeable and educated you are. On the one hand, I'm like, oh my gosh, man, if we, if we interview Neville, that's going to send lightning through the church in Australia. Part of me wondered if that's what would happen. And then another part of me is like, well, there were Neville's before Neville and Mormons, Mormon belief is resilient. And so many Mormons are in the bubble. Australia Mormonism is just going to yawn and it's going to be business as usual, even though Neville comes on Mormon stories. What do you have any thoughts about what, what's most likely in terms of the impact of your word getting I, around about your interview? I, I don't know. I I've, I've been interviewed by Gina Coleman. Um, and and I think that was my dipping my toe into the water just to see how they'd react. I got no real hierarchical reaction at all. Um, and I think a couple of years ago when we were first talking about maybe coming on your show, um, Penny was a little bit worried about the implications it might have for the church, for the family, you know, and how I might be excommunicated and all that sort of thing. I think we're all past that and we couldn't care less. They can they can do what they like. Um, I don't think anything will happen, but if it does, well, what have I said today that would be would be terrible? Apart from thinking that uh, Nelson is a fool, um, well, that's that's verifiable fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from that, what what have I what have I said that uh, is going to get anyone too upset so that they want to go through a, a show trial of excommunicating me? Um, they can do what they like. I don't care. But so you're still a member of record. Yeah, and they can, and and if they don't want me as a member of record, then maybe I'll feel let off the leash and I'll really let some stuff go. <laughs> but no, look, I I I I'm grateful for the church for what it's done for me. I love the members. Um, I think that it's based on false claims, and that's about as far as I need to go. And if right. someone were to ask you if you were if you were ever invited to participate in the second anointing, you would you have an answer? Uh, no, <laughs> no, okay. no, no, you don't have an answer or no, you no, were... no, I do have an answer. And the answer is no, <laughs> you weren't invited. No, I wasn't invited. No, I, I think it's a heap of poppycock. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really quickly. What go a little bit more to detail. What's your opinion on the second anointing? Look, when I, when I was, when I was young and a real scriptorian and really, uh, invested and immersed in the scriptures. I understood that the second anointing was something where the Savior appeared to you and you received him as the second comforter. I didn't think it was some sort of sham uh, little ritual where your wife washes your feet and, you know, you get anointed and all that sort of thing. I, that just can't be what the scriptures intended. So uh, I think it's just uh, something they've cobbled together so they've got something to to uh, offer the uh, the really good good members of the church, but no, I think it's I think it's an utter joke. <laughs> okay, tell us what you really think, Neville. Oh, okay, you want, don't want me to hold back. <laughs> <laughs> Neville, you're delightful, and we had one one viewer say you're the best dressed Mormon stories interviewee we've that, that's ever come on the show. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't wear my tux. I would have wear them away. <laughs> Somebody else yeah. said you look like Colonel. You look like an Australian Colonel Sanders. Do you know? Yeah, what that I've means? been, I've been, I've been chan <laughs> channeling my inner Colonel Sanders for a while now. This, this actually, I actually grew this for two reasons. There are two reasons for it. The first is a, a reminder that I've recovered from cancer because I lost all my hair, and the fact that I can grow a beard again 
is just a reminder I'm a survivor. But also it's something that I never grew ever when I was active in the no. church because the church said don't grow beards, so I didn't. Well, that doesn't apply to me anymore as far as I'm concerned, so I grew it. So, yeah, that's that's the that's what it says to me every morning when I get up and look at myself in the mirror, not who's this old guy with the beard, but um, it's uh, you have recovered and you're doing okay and um, no one is telling you how to dress or how to behave. Wow. Oh, that's a powerful statement. That was like bliss. Yeah. All right, Neville. Well, you're lovely. You're delightful. We want to welcome you back to Mormon Stories anytime you want to share your opinion about everything. <laughs> uh -oh. I don't think you'll ever want me back for that. <laughs> but okay. look, I've, I've enjoyed it very much. It's been delightful with you two. Uh, lovely to meet you both in this way. Uh, I feel very privileged to have spent some time with you. Thanks. Place is all ours and, and a lot of our viewers and listeners are saying thank you uh, because people loved our time together. So thank you, Neville. It's been great. Well, thank you. I, I love you all too. And I love your audience. They're great people. Okay. See you later. All right, Neville. Thank you so Bye. much. You're great. Gerardo, uh, thanks so much for joining us today on Mormon Stories, Gerardo. And thanks for helping make this happen. Your relationship with Simon has been really valuable to Mormon Stories. And I just appreciate all you do both cinematography and just as a friend and as a colleague uh, this year has been amazing and you've been a big part of it. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. I enjoy it. All right. Stay in touch, Gerardo. Right. And uh, listeners and viewers, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks to Simon Southerton and, and all you do. And uh, thanks to everyone who makes Mormon stories podcast possible. Uh, we exist on the generosity of our donors uh, we have about a thousand to fifteen hundred donors that that make up our revenue, and we couldn't do it without you. We don't pay for sponsorships. Uh, we, you know, we don't do product placement. We don't even really fundraise. All we do is is those of you who value what we do. Um, you guys click the donate button, and you become monthly donors, and that's what pays the bills. So thanks to everyone who donates. If you uh, don't donate. Um, but you take value from, um, you know, this program, if you can't afford to support us, don't feel guilty for a second. We do this. We give this away for free, literally. So everyone can benefit. So don't lose any sleep over not supporting us. But if you are in a position to pay $10 a month or 20 bucks a month or hundred bucks a month, whatever you can afford, we just want you to know that we lose, uh, 10 to 12 to 15 donors a month. And, uh, you know, whether it's people lose interest or they move on or they believe some sort of smear that's been said or they go to support another podcast or they fall on financial hard times. Uh, we we are always losing donors. And if we don't replace those donors, then we our budget drops and then we have to start firing people or letting people go or cutting services. So if you do value this content and if you want to see it continue, we need you to step up. Less than one out of a thousand of our of our viewers or listeners actually donate. Um, and, and if we could just make two or three of, of, of a thousand donate or become contributors, that would transform us and allow us to really help a lot more people. So th thanks for the support. Please support us if you can. Um, thanks for everyone who makes this possible. One really big way you can support us is by going on the Apple podcast app uh, and giving us a positive review. We have so many haters there that don't even listen to the podcast but they 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 just hate that what we stand for so they go and write one star reviews and bring our ratings down i think our ratings are down on apple podcast to like 3.6 no 4.6 out of 5 we used to have a 4.9 rating on apple podcast so we could really use support to up our our average rating um cuz i've read those negative reviews and it's just like i hate john delin cuz he hates the church and I don't even think those people even watch or listen to the podcast. So if you can, please go to Apple podcast, give us a positive review, go to Spotify and give us a positive review. And that's needed to keep our, um, to keep our reviews high. So that people don't think it's a bad podcast. You can also rate us on the, uh, Facebook, uh, more stories podcast page. You can follow us on TikTok at more stories podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Mormon stories. Um, and you can follow us on, on YouTube 
or on Facebook. All of that helps with the algorithms. Please share these episodes. Please spread the word. And if you have good uh, ideas for episodes or feedback, we always welcome your feedback at mormonstories at gmail.com. We welcome constructive criticism as well as compliments. I love constructive feedback. So uh, please share it. Um, we love you guys. Thanks to all the staff at, at the Open Stories Foundation that make all this possible. Gerardo, Kara Burrell, uh, Brooklyn Alden, uh, Jennifer, Jen Camp just started with us. Uh, and of course, um, Clint Martin and Carrie Whitbeck on our board. There are so many people that make all this possible. Thanks to everyone who makes this possible. Thanks for our viewers and thanks to all our interviewees. Again, we couldn't do it as well. Love you guys. Thanks for everything. Please stay tuned and we'll see. Be good to each other. Most importantly, be loving and kind and good to each other. Find truth, find goodness. And uh, we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.